welcome to another episode of uh, Mark and Elmer's PSI, Piano Scene Investigations. Glad you're here with us today. We Thank have you. much to talk about, lots of things happening in the news uh, concerning the piano world. Uh, apparently, let's see, I noticed the two links you sent me this week. Uh, Yuja Wang has a, had her Carnegie Hall recital. Uh -huh. And what a program that was. Very interesting. Yeah, uh -huh. very interesting. She had some Scriabin. She had some Messiaen. She had, uh, what else was there? I don't even remember anymore. But it was quite an interesting program. Lots of uh, modern things in it. Uh, I also liked her encores. Uh -huh. The encores was quite interesting. Few. She did, uh, I noticed that she added another Chifra piece to her already growing uh, Chifra repertoire. She mm -hmm. did the uh, Schifra arrangement of the Blue Danube, uh -huh. which, yeah, which is, a, that one's quite a bear too. I mean, not, I don't see very many that would be easy, to tell you the truth. So, uh, if you are born today, today is the 15th? Well, actually, what's today's date? It's Thursday, May 16th. 16th. Oh, it is the 16th, yeah. So if you are born today, you have the same birthday as Liberace. Hooray. Hooray. So, um, you said you had, you knew, uh, you know some stories about Liberace? Well, you guys, do you know who Liberace was? Remember I told you in a recent course that Jin Jin, my uh, Korean, uh, South Korean guitar colleague at uh, Cyprus, taught a course in rock and roll. It was for, you know, the yeah. whole university kind of thing, music appreciation. And he said, well, this is going to be really fun because we get to start this whole course with Elvis. And at least half the class was blank. <laughs> now, this is <laughs> both in Turkish right. culture in Cyprus, but uh, but also younger people. You know. But he said, you guys do know who, Cyprus, who Elvis was? No, sir. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> well, you're going to by the time we get done with him. And, of course, everybody loved Elvis and everything. But... You know, um, Elvis, originally, you know, he just wore pretty much ordinary clothes. Yeah. Right? But later on, he got into the rhinestones, the sequins, and all the stuff. In the room. And you know who taught him how to dress that way? Famously. Liberace. Liberace. <laughs> Liberace was quite a bit older than Elvis, but not that much older. But he, you know, Elvis was a, a young... 20, maybe something, and Liberace yeah. was at least 10 years or more his senior. But he, uh, there's a famous time when they got together in the same recording area, something like that, and I mean, different studios, and stuff, but um, Liberace sat down and advised him about clothes. He said, yeah. well, it can make a difference in terms of, you know, the appeal and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And then a really funny part was apparently at some point musicians will do this. Yeah. Elvis took the piano and the Barachi took the guitar and they tried. No! <laughs> God! There were no recording sessions of that because uh, Liberace says, well, you play the piano damn, be damn well better than I can play the guitar. guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but then Elvis said, oh, no, Mr. Lee or something. I think they used yeah. to call it. No, I can't play the piano like you can. But Liberace was born in uh, Milwaukee, I believe. He was born in Wisconsin. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, well, to, well enough to do his middle class yeah. family. His son, very famously, he gets remembered, my brother George. I wish my brother George were here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they put him through good piano lessons. I think he went to the conservatory in Milwaukee. Uh, I'm not sure that he ever went. I don't think he went to the university or anything like that. Yeah. Because pretty much by the time he was done, uh, he had to kind of get out there and start working, but actually when he was a teenager, he, he found, you know, like young people tend to do, he loved going off to the clubs and playing in the, in the place, but, I mean, this guy had an Oscar Peterson-like technique. You know Oscar Peterson, the famous black oh, yeah. uh, Canadian, by the way, origin, mm -hmm. uh, jazz pianist, uh, was also classically trained. He had a Hungarian yeah. piano teacher, talked about how he learned to Chopin etudes and everything like that. But that guy had oh, fingers, holy crap. Yeah. Um, but uh, Liberace started working like that, and then he was uh, growing up in a time when they had the bands and everything in the 30s and 40s, and he got into that. 
by the time he was in his 40s, because I think he was born like around 19, late teens in the 1900s. So I think he was uh, getting up there for military service age. Yeah. Because he never did that. But, uh, you know, the guy had an extraordinary career. Oh, um, yeah. Um, I have a book of some of his music. This is, again, my father's copy. Oh, yeah. But some arrangements of Liberace's are quite good. I play, I've play. i learned some of them play them. And I even dressed one up even more than he had it. Uh -huh. But um, it says a lot of different things, quotes and stuff on that book. And uh, it said, President Truman's favorite pianist. Oh, well, and he was. Mm -hmm. um, a lot, of course, with a lot of older stars. Uh, he was really famous in Las Vegas. He had a mm -hmm. big show at the uh, something with the word river or water in it. The casino. Up. No, um, I actually went to that casino. It's subsequently been torn down now. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I never saw him perform live. But uh, he did, of course, television specials. Oh, yeah, he did. And he'd had a very popular TV show in the 1950s yeah. for a few years. Quite a few. Um, yeah, show. Very entertaining shows, you know, yeah. really good. And the, come on, the guy could play. And then he would do these kind of like supersonic kind of things, like supersonic boogie woogie, boogie or yeah. different things. That's not what he called it, but. Um, and I remember uh, there was one uh, Las Vegas show they did where he invited people to come. He did this probably more than once, but yeah. the cameras to come into his home in Las Vegas. And <laughs> <laughs> what? just the antiques and the, I mean, it was plush. It was full. Uh -huh. He was showing off some desk that was belonged to Louis the 15th or 14th, whatever oh, like that. The bed was, the bed that he had would belong to one of the, late Russian czars. Oh. I mean, this guy had so much money. I thought it was going to be in the shape of a piano. Decades. So. <laughs> well, he did that famously, the piano-shaped pool. Oh, he did? I had okay. a piano-shaped pool. But I think that was in California. He had several homes. Um, when I, um, year, uh, years ago, I went to Las Vegas. I had really no desire to go to a place like that, I thought. Uh, it was kind of like, you know, it's not my cup of tea. But my violin friend, Norman Powell, who had played for 29 years, I think, for the Perardi Quartet, and then had had a career for more than 45 years in street quartet playing. Um, he, uh, the fellow that he had work on his violin, and I think the one that he still had at that time was an Amati. It was worth a half a million dollars at least. It's one of the Amatis were a slightly bigger violin, you know. Good, rich chocolate he's now. Um, but the fellow that worked on it was from Salt Lake City. There's some very good violin or string people out in the West. And I think part of that too, in fact, Norman's son, um, I put a little plug in for him, Eric Paulu, P A U L U, he's a bow maker and quite well known for it. Makes string bows. Huh. Beautiful work. Does, of course, gorgeous woodwork. He does side projects and yeah. things. Puts them up on Facebook and they're really lovely. But Norman had a summer home. I think that's where he now still lives, in Tucson. His original summer home was in Allen's Park, Colorado, where he would go in the summertime because members of the faculty up there uh, taught and performed at this fest summer festival area up in near Estes Park in Allen's Park, Colorado. Kind of north central area above you know, uh, farther up above Boulder and stuff not quite as far as Fort Collins but anyway uh, Norman and his partner Judy were going to go to Europe I think for a while and he found out that his violin uh, repairman fixer guy mm -hmm. uh, every year he did a vacation in Las Vegas uh, his family, it was, he and his wife got married, and they had two kids, uh, and the grandkids, and there were two sets of parents, right. grandparents. One set was from the East Coast, and one set was from the West Coast. Right. And they'd all decided for some years, once the boys were born, 
to meet in Vegas once a year for a okay. week, and they could all, you know, spend yeah. time as a family. They were staying at the Venetian, I think. Mm -hmm. Is that where, where? What was the one called? No, Mirage. They were yeah. in the Mirage. That's where the the lion tamer guys yeah. used to be okay. with the volcano Siegfried fire. Roy. Siegfried and Roy. Roy. <laughs> so I um. He he came to me and he said. Uh, I'll pay you four hundred dollars for your expenses and stuff. You know, this should cover you know a couple of nights in the hotel, and, um, gas and so forth, things like that. Okay. A little bit of fun time. This is twenty five years ago or something, so it was a while back. Um, so four hundred dollars was still four hundred dollars. Yeah. But um, he said, I'm, "I'd like you to take my violin up to." Las Vegas and give it to the guy. Wow. And Norman and I were very good buddies, good friends. Uh, he'd been my uh, my chamber music mentor in my master's program in Madison. And when I graduated, he came and he said to me, he said, why don't you come by sometime and we'll play the Brahms sonatas together. He coached me in the Brahms C minor trio, piano trio, and then we did Quite a bit of playing together different times yeah. after that. It was a great compliment for me that a magnificent violinist like Norman uh, would uh, invite you over. Yeah. Well, to play with him. You know? yeah. My teacher Howard played with Norman. You know? It's that kind of thing. Uh, it's highly decorated. The, the Priority Quartet at one time was on. I don't know if they won it, but they were one of four or five. Uh, street quartets. I don't know, it was just the United States or all over the world nominated for the Toscanini Prize. Um, I mean, the, the Priority Quartet, it's still, still in residence, all different members now in Wisconsin. Been there since 1939. Anyway, I took the violin, and Norman was such a funny guy. He said, Now, this thing is insured, so don't get all whacked up about it, you know, but. I put a car covered up carefully to make sure nobody's going to see it immediately right. like that. <laughs> he said, uh, it's insured for $600,000, $650,000, something like that. He had two violins. He had one that began with a B. It was an even earlier one with a really fat belly and a fat back that he would play sometimes beautiful sweet box. And then he, he would play the Amati with his, what he called his Brahms bow. I'm not sure if that's the one that Eric made for him or not, but mm. wow. It was beautiful sound, beautiful playing. But I was a little nervous. But then he made a typical Norman joke. He said, now just in case we don't see each other again, and you decide to run off to Mexico with my violin, I want half of what you get for it. <laughs> 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 that was Norman guy, though. Oh, He's still cool. alive down there. So, but uh, I took it to Las Vegas and um, stayed at uh, this 1950s kind of hotel. I can't remember the names of these places now, but it's across from Circus Circus, but now it's gone. And in place of all that stuff right there, where both Liberace had his shows originally, and where I stayed, that's all been leveled down. And the guy, what's his name, who owns Las Vegas, built his newest massive. Uh, casino hotel thing and everything. Um, so that stuff's all gone. Wow. But um, it was cool because real quickly, I mean, I had the violin and I put it under the bed in my hotel room. All right. And I just, it was so hot. Oh my God, it's so hot in Vegas. I think people probably sleep during the day and then get up late afternoon and stay up all night long and stuff because yep. Vegas is a night town. Wow. Big time. Oh, all awesome. morning long. All morning long. But um, it was kind of cool. I thought, okay, I'm here. And I got checked in and everything. And he said, you know, and I didn't want to get trapped in the room because I wasn't going to see the guy until lunchtime the next day. Right. So I put the thing under the bed, shoved it in there, and I went out for a walk and stuff. And so some things that I saw when I was there was really cool. I got the books here. I went to, you know, the Museum of Modern Art, MoMA. Okay. And, you know, the famous one is the Frank Lloyd Wright Museum in New York, right. where you go all the way up and then you walk all down to the spiral like that. There's also one in Venice, 
Uh, no, I'm, I'm not the Museum of Honor. The Guggenheim, right? Guggenheim, okay. Where's the Museum of Honor? I forget. Anyway. <laughs> Shit, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm going to talk off the my head. Well, Peg, Peg, the Guggenheims, didn't they create the Museum of Modern Art? Because it is the Museum yeah. of Modern Art. Frank Ladbrook is. So they have like five or six sites in the world. Right. Las Vegas is one. There's one in New York. There's one in v uh, Venice. There's one in South America somewhere. I'm not sure. Hmm. So there's only five or six. But the newest one was in Vegas. And they had two really amazing exhibitions. Um, I found out that it was there. I don't think I went that first night. But I made a point to go because the, the entrance wasn't very expensive. You can do really cool stuff in Vegas on the cheap or not too pricey. You know, there's a famous, uh, what's it called, the, the, the shrimp cocktail for, for a dollar yeah. at the uh, Binion's. The fam old famous 19th century place is still there. That, that $10 steak dinner with everything. But uh, it's massive. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. But so what they did, they had two different shows. And one was really cool uh, because nobody had seen this art for almost 100 right. years. It was treasures, impressionist treasures from the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. Hmm. Now, until the Soviet Union collapsed, and then sometime after that, that stuff had been locked up there since the 19th century when these wealthy czarist period Russians had gone and bought and collected art in Paris. And it belonged to them personally, but of course, it didn't want the Soviets because they took everything and made it state property and put it in. Uh, sometimes it was given to the Hermitage Museum. But it was really cool to see the stuff, especially because there was a smallish portrait painting, a smallish portrait painting of um, Cezanne. Wow. And it was rather darkish the way it was done. It was, yeah. and, but the, the cool thing about a lot, a lot of it, most of the paintings, was the frames that they were in. Because this is apparently what caused such a big uproar originally in Paris okay. when the Impressionists first had their shows. The people, they had very, those kind of like baroque 18th century-ish, kind of thick, you know, and three-dimensional kind of creating space frames around the pictures, around the paintings. Some of them were, and they, well, they, they just recycled old frames. They took them off other paintings, you know, and made them fit to their paintings yeah. and stuff like that. And apparently what shocked the people was this was like the very first opening of an Impressionist thing. They had found that they weren't getting really good gallery time mm -hmm. at the time, at the beginning of the movement. And so 25 of them or so got together and rented space, and they did their own exhibition. It was the first <laughs> one. And Gertrude Stein talked about that. She wrote about it. She, she went to it and said, what an incredible event it was because the people were in absolute shock, it was almost scandalized, because they went in to see all this painting, you know, and with assumptions about what painting was about. And then they saw the very familiar frames, but then they looked inside what was in the frame and they thought, holy shit, what the hell is that? You know? And I, then that uh, thing I talked about before, <laughs> that monologue play that uh, Pat, what's her name, Pat Carroll did, uh, Gertrude, Stein, Gertrude, Stein, Gertrude Stein, she imitates some of the things in her kind of way of writing but with the Matisse painting. She says, but what is that green on her nose, on her nose, on her nose? Oh, God. Well, I suppose it's some kind of green, I suppose, I suppose, I suppose. <laughs> so I saw that, and then totally cool, on the other side of the museum, the two, two, they have two exhibition spaces, was the history of Harley Davidson. Motorcycles Whoa. in America. And then they also had some earlier ones, like the Chieftain or what it was called. Yeah. Indian. Indian motorcycles. But it was, let's put it this way, it was sponsored by Harley Davidson. And it was the history of motorcycles from America, pretty much the beginning. And they had all these motorcycles. Amazing. I mean, just from the, basically nowadays, we're going back. I saw some two kind of chubby kids that could better use regular bicycles, but then the electric ones. Yeah. When I was out driving yesterday, I thought this boy's 
should have real biases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, I'm not sure, but I think the, the Harley Davidson actually have a line of motorcycles. Yeah, called the Valkyries. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm talking a lot here. This is all about the brunch because oh. what I was going to get to. Yeah. The other thing that I visited was the Liberace Museum oh. in uh, Las Vegas, and it was you know pretty interesting. It was privately run, and this was interesting. You know, he didn't have any jump. Liberace was gay, but he played that down. That's and also fought uh, some press in England in the later fifties that no. suggested something. And I'm not sure when they passed the laws that changed. You know, that Oscar Wilde was in prison for a while because of yeah. homosexual, and they didn't change those laws. I think until the seventies in England, uh -huh. but. Um, he fought it and he won, actually. He won a significant award for England. You know? yeah. He didn't need the money, but he took it. And yeah. What he wanted was people to stay out of his private life. Right. I think with the furs and the jewels and everything, a lot of people. But it was weird because he appealed to the middle class people. and he, They just, you know, yeah. that, that, well, that's his stick. Yeah, that's his stick. Wow. That bed with the furs and stuff that belong yeah. to the Tsar. No way would it. I'm sorry. I don't mean this in a fit. Come on. I've got some really great, uh, great gay friends. Yeah. Come on, guys. You have to agree that you wouldn't expect that kind of fluffy, foofy, over the top style yeah. to be in a straight man's bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, anyway. Uh, the, there was a, a private society which supported his memory yeah. and kept the museum going. Right. I, I, I did not, well, I played a few notes on it. Some yeah. kid sat down and tried to play the famous Baldwin with the mirrors on it. Yeah. All that yeah. stuff. Sadly, no. the piano was no. just a wreck. Oh, no. It was a wreck. <laughs> Not in tune, not in kept. It wasn't kept out. Oh. Now I subsequently learned part of this. In the whole thing, you know, when you go to when you go to a restaurant, yeah. Which let's say you guys in the East Coast, you definitely want to talk about New Jersey, parts of New York, but New Jersey, okay. And over here in the Midwest, we got some stuff like that here in Ohio, but definitely up around Chicago and southern Wisconsin places. Where those guys yeah. tended to hang out, you know, yeah. the over plush kind of furniture and dark yeah. wood and the lights and all this and the old, you know cocktail bars, but you know that kind of you know, 1950s, 1960s, you know, yeah. smoking and drinking yeah. and uh, not all legal kind of stuff. Right. I won't get on by his bad side there. <laughs> I don't um, think so. Going to the Liberace Museum, it felt a little like that, like you were stepping back in time. Into this, yeah, in time. I think, I mean, it felt, in some, I mean, there was new stuff that had been there yeah. since he'd been doing his shows, but it felt like one of those old steakhouse, clubhouse yeah. kind of restaurants that you, when you go on vacation in Wisconsin and you go around the corner, and there's one there. And, it's been there since the 40s and the heydays with the 50s and 60s. Yeah. And they're still there and people still go. The food hasn't changed. Uh -huh. the, the mixed drinks haven't changed. They're still the original recipes and stuff. It kind of felt like that. And then it was a little disappointing because it just seemed a little, a little, just a little. Yeah. Well, I just learned that um, in the news, I think it happened after COVID. I'm not exactly sure when, but you look it up. They permanently closed the Liberace Museum. Um, they permanently? Yeah, because the basically the support group for him yeah. went defunct. They wow. didn't have the money anymore to do it. This guy was as rich as Midas oh, in sure. his time. I don't know what happened to all the money, but the saddest part when I was there, I went to see that house yeah. that was featured because I, I, I found out the address and everything, and I went to see the house that he showed off in that TV show yeah, with all the beautiful yeah. home and has a, a 
Moroccan terracotta tile <laughs> stuff and sunroof kind of things open at the top, you know, probably for the boys to yeah. throw off their clothes and do their thing in the sunshine and <laughs> nobody was going to care because it was technically inside the house up on, yeah. on the roof. It was a very interesting, wonderful house, as you'd expect. Mansion, come on. Yeah. It was closed. It was locked up. There were some fencing and gates around it. Yeah. And it was derelict. It looked bad. It's amazing how you take the life away from a place, how quickly it just, by its very nature, and it was in a decent neighborhood. Yeah. And I think it was probably still there because it was Wells Liberace's mansion. And I don't know what they did with it, but by the time I was there in Vegas, it had been not open and not used. Yeah. I thought I read that somebody was interested in buying it. But then some other people were thinking of buying it and leveling it and putting all your thing in. Wow. Because, you know, it's always it costs more money to refurbish your house. Yeah. Than it does to even build new one. Right. So it's kind of sad, but because um, in his time, you know, the guy, what was, he had a nick, did the king or something, a pianist or something like oh. that? Oh. Well, that's you know, a good remember, question. But, but he had a title that they kind of referred to him as. They called him Mr. Entertainer. Mr. Entertainer, for sure. For sure. There was a, was it Oprah? There was an Late in interview. his life when yes. he was ill. Yeah. He and went up there and he played, some, uh, I think it was during Christmas time, he played some Christmas carols at the piano. There's people were shocked there. by how much he looked aged, but yeah. he uh, was one of the unfortunate earlier folks that caught, that got HIV positive yeah. and developed AIDS. And I mean, it was horrific. Yeah. I mean, for a little while when we had the COVID thing recently and people were all scared and everything, early on, the AIDS epidemic in the 90s, it was a period of time when people were really shit scared about it. I mean, I think it was even like, earlier. Do you know that. what the name of that movie is? Which movie? Well, it was an early a movie about homosexual guys, but it was a Hollywood made film. There's some very famous actors in it. I think it was like at least eight guys that starred in it. Okay. I think it was in the 80s. Was it, uh, it was the one with Al Pacino in it? I, no. No, I know that. That's Cruiser? Uh, the uh, Al Pacino one. That's where he plays the bad Jewish lawyer guy in... Uh, Justice for All? No, it's... Uh, but I know... It's him. about the Angels in America. That's Angels in America. Okay. This would be before that. I'll look it up, guys, and I'll find okay. it. But uh, there's one fellow I think of who was a natural blonde... He was a little bit older, but a very handsome fellow. But it's a movie about well-to-do guys. I think it was based in California, in San Francisco, yeah. which is where the real right. stuff hit the fan. Yeah. And uh, never forget this terrible scene. One of the young fellows, there's a young partner of one of the older guys. Because I think most of the guys that are featured in this were like, uh, it, it kind of focuses on the wealthy uh Trust and legacy holding boys yeah. whose grandfathers have made fortunes. And now they were living the truly gay high life yeah. in San Francisco. And it, it, I mean, the disease was just eviscerating the community. And the, 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 the scary part in the one scene is this young guy starts to get, and he starts to get the lesions. And, um, they got him in this tight little space in the hospital, surrounded by all these machines, just machines, yeah. things to try to keep him alive and breathing. He's all hooked up and stuff, and plastic tent thing around the space. Mm -hmm. And no people will go into it, the nurses will go into it. Because at that time, people thought it was like the plague that you could get it for breathing on yeah. somebody. Yeah. I have a friend, of course, I'm not going to name him now, but a very dear friend. Uh, very, great professional musician who's been living HIV positive now for a number of years. And he's now, now of course they've developed some medicine. Yeah. He actually can take a medicine which keeps the illness in check. 
not uh, just in check, but uh, like, what do you call it when you get shingles, but then you don't have shingles and it goes to sleep inside your body? Uh, anyway, it goes deep asleep inside. So he has a wonderful partnership with a friend now, and fortunately very happy again in his life. And he can't give the illness to his friend, so they can be intimate with one another. Um, and the ch but the change in all of that has been big. Well, Liberace didn't make it. Yeah. He he caught it and eventually killed him. It's sad for me to think he had, the home where he died was in Palm Springs. That was another yeah. place he had a house. And he was there with his uh, maid lady, housekeeper lady, and the nurse. And they were the ones that were there, hear the last words, last breaths, everything. And he died completely alone just with the two ladies there in his house. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much intentional that was, though, because when it came down to it, I, when it came down to it, he was extremely private about the reality of his life. Oh, yeah. I mean, people pretty much knew as time went on, but he never, ever said that he was. Okay. Right. Um, well, that's about his life, and I've always been interested in the life as much as the skills and the talents of the composers, yeah. to be honest. But the boy could play the piano. Oh, yeah. Shoo. Some of the highest points are really, I think some of the stuff that he played with those massive rings. Yeah. That crap in the Vegas shows, that was garbage. I mean, it was still impressive. It was impressive to me. Yeah. They could play with that much weight on his fingers, you yeah. know. But those Baldwin pianos he played, oh, those yeah. things were glassed out. Um, I mean, they had more yeah. glass in them than a greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's cool. laughs> but um, yeah. the 1950s TV shows, which you can watch on yeah. YouTube, for you example, sure can. You um, can. Look him up, and the guy, he was handsome, he was fit. Yeah. You know, he's, um, he always sang, I'll be seeing you at the I'll end of the show. I'll be seeing you. Yeah. And he did some films, too. Oh, yeah. They Sincerely to, yours? They tried to cast I him know. as a romantic lead. Yeah. Um, Nine people bought it. There were certain people in the industry that didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was yeah. actually, they were made almost about the same time that Van Clyburn won. What, the, the Tchaikovsky. Oh, yeah. The movies are yeah. kind of around that period. Yeah. That's, and I was, shortly after that, I was born. That back in those days, being a concert pianist was like, wow. Yeah, I know. You still. You you some of that what do you do? Exists. I'm a concert pianist. Wow. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Nowadays, uh, oh, we still get that. I play. I play rock guitar. Oh, oh, oh. then all the girls went out there. Used to be that the ladies would go after us. Yeah. To These be honest, kids, yeah. they did anyway, yeah. but not the way the rock guys get them. No. no if you, okay. All right. You, you, want, you still want to get a reaction, right? And they ask you, what do you do? Don't just say you're a pianist. Yeah. Tell concert. them you're a concert, concert pianist. pianist. Yeah. Okay. There, you'll get you'll get the look or the well, eyebrows. Part, part of the look you might get nowadays is one that's like, what the hell is that? <laughs> I've never had that. I don't think I've ever. Well, had I sometimes that. think that people are like what's a concert pianist, but because you know, we are representing that massive part of the iceberg, yeah, which is always hidden from the present yes. contemporary yes. mind and memory. Yes. So I talk awful lot about the Brucci, but in a way, that's a well. Let me tell you some stories I know. I do know about. Liberace. I was just going to okay. say, I did that as a tribute to my dad. Okay. Because dad just thought, coming from where he did in the Depression. And, okay. And he came. I lived my father's life because his family couldn't afford to send him to school. Right. But he was a much more nationally gifted musician. The guy was in his 70s, mm -hmm. even going on 80. Still playing excerpts from the Roy Polonaise, Greek and Cherub, Beethoven's. Mm -hmm. Wow. Various things he'd learned decades before with his Juilliard trained piano teacher. Mm -hmm. Dad was a heck of a player. And um, then the amazing thing about the guy is he had, you know, stacks of music and stuff, but when he'd sit down, he eventually migrated more towards a theater organ, and he had a four or five million one in his house. Wow. And then when he died, my sisters found that he had 11 or 12 organs in storage lockers that he bought and kept. 
And then, How many organs? Maybe a dozen. Some of them big. He loved Hammond organs. Wow. And he had several different ones of those. That's but a lot. Um, I remember times in the holidays, and just for his own pleasure, on the weekend, you know, particularly on Sundays, we'd gone to church and later on in the afternoon. Everybody's a little sleepy, a little tired, a little this or that, doing their own thing on Sunday. Let's say from three or four until six or seven at night, yeah. you just start to hear the organ music that Dad would be playing just for his own pleasure. Oh. I've, I saw him at times play two or three hours and never crack open a book of music. It was, it's like you. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay. it was a walking jukebox. Jukebox, yeah. yeah. But he always thought that Liberace was creme de la creme in terms of success. He always used to tell me, he said, someday I want to see you playing the piano on Johnny Carson show like that. <laughs> that was going to be the culmination of achievement for in Dad's uh, mind. And uh, we had, I, I got to go to college and for a while. It was an insufferable snot, I think. But <laughs> uh, Dad still loved me and put up with me and I came around. I, just, uh, I loved the man. He died in, in uh, 2018. And uh, I still miss him, still think about him. And in a sense, there's aspects of him that live in me as memories or in what I do. So, so that's the Bracci, but you got some stories. Oh, about yeah, him. I do that. So I, um, He's really talking about I never know. I never, I never knew how he got the name Liberace. You know that? You do know the story. Yeah, that's a family name. It is a family uh, name. I heard his was, real name was, was Walter. Valentino. Liberace. Vlazio. It was Vlazio Valentino Liberace. Oh. Because the father was Italian and yeah. the mother was Polish. Oh. So he's a Polish pianist. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's something of that. Um, his wow. name was actually Vlazio Valentino. I think it's Valentino Liberace. Okay. And um, he. Anglicized it into Walter. Walter, okay. Uh, but eventually, uh, people that knew him personally called him Lee. Lee, wow. That's amazing. When you hear him even talk about himself, when I was visiting yeah. so and so, just said Lee. And then you'd hear people talk about him, and they always referred to him as Lee. That's like uh, Van Cliver. Yeah. It was Harvey something B. Harvey, yeah, something Van Cliver. Yeah. And he eventually just became Van. Van, yeah. Nobody called him Howard. Howard said that. Howard, my teacher Howard was a Juilliard. They were colleagues. Yeah. In Rosina Levine's studio. And he, said, he said it was such a astonishing because everybody called him Van. Everybody thought his name was Van Cliver. Yeah, I would have thought That's that the way too. he presented himself. Yeah, I'm, exactly. I am Van. And um, apparently he was a very charming and rather yeah. self facing and somewhat soft-spoken Texas boy. Yeah. But um, he won the concerto competition yeah. while he was at Juilliard. Yeah. And of course, what he played was the Tchaikovsky. Yeah. And it's a very formal, I think it still is, it's a very formal event at Juilliard. Yeah. Uh, at least it was back then, of course, because yeah. everybody was wearing the tails. And yeah. The bed, yeah. Played with the Juilliard Orchestra and all that. And then his name was in the program. And it said soloist Harvey Van Cliburn. And Howard used to love to tell that story because he said they ragged on him for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Harvey, that was a great tight, man. <laughs> great and he hated the name Harvey. Oh, <laughs> the girls, he said, only my mother calls me Harvey. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> well, anyways, back to um, Liberace. Yeah. Now, what I do know about uh, Liberace is, uh, and I did watch, I used to watch his uh, specials on television, and I did learn a lot. Uh -huh. About improvising, yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I picked up the tricks about you know double arpeggios going this way, and that one trick that he used to do, where I think it was in the his improvisations on the Strauss waltzes, mm. where he goes out yeah. on single notes, and I, yeah. and I picked that up right away, and I yeah. used to double it up with octaves instead. And made it Honestly, I think so. octaves are easier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, the 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 thing yeah like that's what he did. Yeah. And then he go, and then you get to the bottom, bomb. Then he just goes sound out of the sound and stuff. Yeah. Boom. So, but uh, regarding that, yeah. 
That's very reminiscent of 19th century uh, music making. Oh, yeah. What he was doing at those shows and playing like that, especially later in his career. Yeah. When you, I'm going to talk about this later. Okay, later. sure. Very reminiscent of um, what they considered a concert. Yeah. Until Liszt had begun to establish it as a yeah. repetition of some great works. Yeah. No, there was this what they call preluding, yeah, which is kind of warming up, which I think is actually a very would be a very comforting thing to do. Oh yeah, I'm just gonna get you to take yeah. a little Joseph stuff. Hoffman used to do that in one of his records, and then an yeah. important part of it was improvisation. Yeah, completely. In many cases, I've seen organists do this, especially mm -hmm. give me a theme, and then they wail on it. Yeah, Frederick Jackish at Wittenberg could do that. He was amazing. Every recital, he would finish by uh, taking recommended themes from the audience, he would choose one yeah. after intermission, and then he'd sit down as almost like an encore. Yeah. Like for 15 or 20 minutes based on the theme. Jeez. And, I mean, Bach-like stuff, it just extraordinary. Wow. But uh, the stuff that Liberace did was actually going back to the Paderewski days. And even yeah. yeah. But truly, even farther back than that. Yeah. So anyway, like the Sigismund Talberg days, for yeah, example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So anyways, the one story I do know about Liberace was what I heard on the radio from Paul Harvey. Hmm. I don't know, you remember Paul Harvey? Yeah. The guy, he used to have a special uh, radio five show. minutes yeah. for sort of an intermission it was every type day. of segment. If it was, you were listening to somehow like white people, slightly Christianish, middle Midwestern. Kind yeah. Of, it came out of... Iowa or, or St. Louis Something or somewhere like is where yeah. the base. It was really good. It was kind of a little bit like a yeah. old, what they call the speak key. Not the, the talks that Franklin Roosevelt did yeah. during the, the presidency. Fireside chats. Fireside chats. Except they usually were in the middle of the day. Yeah. But he'd record this thing and he had kind of a middle American, somewhat conservative, what we yeah. say, but not. Yeah. Nearly like people think of conservative yeah. nowadays. Um, it was a very strong voice, very confident. And people liked him because he told the truth or talked about things in a very sensible and kind yeah. of obvious or clear way. Yeah. People respected the man. Paul yeah. Harvey was his yeah. name. I'll, always, I'll throw a picture of yeah. him. Yeah. He, always ended the, so. uh, he always ended the broadcast with... And you know the rest of the story. story. Yeah. yeah. So, but anyways, he did tell this story about a young man. Um, he was about eight to ten years old, and he had this infected right arm. Liberace. Yeah. This was Liberace, and the doctors were baffled by it. You know, for years they tried to figure out how to solve the problem of this infection, and they just simply couldn't find a cure for it. And they said that they were afraid that the arm would someday have to come off. Jeez. It would have to come off. Jeez. So anyways, there was a time when the mother refused to believe that his little, her little boy was going to lose his arm. So one night, I guess she took her little boy up into these hills and there was this cabin. Okay. And had this fireplace old, you know, pioneering this is Wisconsin. Yeah, this is yeah. Wisconsin. Not too hard to find. Anyway, this. she built a fire, and she stuck this sort of this hearth in it, filled it up with all this water. Hmm. You know, and you know, and this, until the water was boiling, and she told her little boy, "Come over here." He says, "Kneel next to me." He says, "Let's pray." And so they prayed. You know, and after they were finished praying, she looks at a little boy and he says, "Son, do you have faith?" He says. Yes, mom. He says, he says, do you trust me? They were Catholics. And, she, and he says, yes, mom. Mm -hmm. She takes that little boy's arm and it's shoves it water. into the boiling water. Uh -huh. And according to Paul Harvey, he says that the pain was so excruciating, he just passed out. Uh -huh. He didn't even have time to scream uh -huh. from the pain. Well, the story has it, she, pulled the, she eventually pulled the arm out of the boiling water, wrapped it up in some gauze, and the following week they went to the doctors to have it examined. Infection, completely gone. Yeah. Was there still any skin on the bones? 
I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? But the, the rest is history. This was Liberace's little boy. I've heard that story. It's so, been a long time since yeah. I heard it. But that was the story I, I told him I heard from uh, he Paul was, Harvey. He says uh, that boy would eventually become one of the uh, greatest international entertainers as the pianist Liberace. And you know the rest of the story. He, he was said. totally devoted to his mother yeah. throughout her life. The way uh, Elvis was with his, too. Oh, yeah. That's They're what both very, very supportive and devoted yeah. and grateful to their mothers. She used to travel sometimes with him. Yeah. To some extent, yeah. she could, especially after his father died, right. and she was freer to, to come and go. But um, she went to see President Truman yeah. because of him. Yeah. Um, I just remember too. There's a uh, uh, there's a Bugs Bunny reference to Liberace. There's a what? A Bugs Bunny. A Bugs. Oh yeah, remember it is. Yes. And he gets yes. Up, trying to look like this. And he goes, I wish my brother George was here. Yeah, he was, he was going to go out. Yeah. Had the kid love brother. It's George, yeah. brother George played the violin. Yeah. yeah. So. so, but anyways, yeah, that was the story I got about uh, Liberace now. Um, years later, we fast forward. I think it was uh, sometime in somewhere between 2010, 2020, Hollywood did, Hollywood did come out with a new movie about Liberace. And if you're interested in it, it's the movie is called Candelabra. That's based on the book. Time. It's based on the book. Yeah. Okay, I did not know that. But I just remembered. I used to have the book. But Mike Douglas stars as Liberace. Wow! So a fine actor, and I'm sure he is a real man. To too. What's her face? Uh, Debbie Moore. No, not Debbie Moore. Uh, that knockout. Catherine. Yeah. Oh, help me out! Really cool knockout woman. Catherine Zeta Jones. Yeah, Zeta Jones. Yeah, Zeta Jones. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. He's played some, uh, and I don't mean, come on, guys, but Michael Douglas. That's who it know? was. And I tell you, I saw the cover of the movie. Well, the cover of the movie, they got the wig and the makeup, and he looks just like him. I wow. swear. He does the smile thing like this. He can do it. Cover. He can do it. Well, he played that. What was the famous Wall Street character? He played that little sleazy oh. investment guy based on a true story. Yeah. And he had the whole hair yeah. slip back thing. He it looks like, like a cat like a little bit. Read. Yeah, it was, it was called Wall Street. Well, yeah, his father, yeah, Kirk Douglas, yeah, played Vincent Van Gogh. Yes, and Lust for Life. Lust for Life, amazing. Movie. Yes, oh my God. Anthony, what's his name? Played uh, Paul Gauguin. Uh, kind of rough guy. Quinn. Anthony, Anthony Quinn. Quinn. Yeah, played Gauguin. So yeah, that's, yeah. Kirk, that's yeah. interesting son and father. Yeah, his dad lived for a long a time. A very long time. He just died recently. Didn't he? I don't know. Just in recent years. Know. But he he was still Kirk, very strong. Kirk was over a hundred years old. But, uh, yeah, I yeah. still watch Spartacus. Never seen Spartacus. Oh, incredible! Gosh, I have it in the folks. If you see Spartacus, a, Spartacus bucket list. Job. Yeah, um, check. Look at that. Watch that movie in the Criterion release. The Criterion mm -hmm. release. There's a. You know the special. It's, oh yeah, it's got extra twenty minutes of extra footage in the thing, and oh, the battle scenes and the parts, oh, amazing. Well, as you can imagine, there's no CG in this. I read about so. it. I don't know that Kirk Douglas was a method actor, yeah. but the people would say he really threw himself in. Oh yeah, absolutely. And would really rehearse really hard, really exhausting. It was almost like intentionally extra hard work all the time. Yeah. Spartacus is a famous historical truth character. Yeah. The movie is Hollywood. But oh, of course it is. He was uh, a slave to the Romans who led a rebellion, which actually caused some ruckus for the Romans for a while. Yeah. Quite a headache. But this was like. A city in Rhode Island taking on the United States. I mean, yeah. It was not going to happen. Yeah. And uh, he gets crucified. It's a really powerful movie. Yes. And Kirk Douglas is just amazing. I mean, he was a great actor. Oh, he was a wonderful actor. And brilliant. Uh, if you ever get a chance to see Lust for Life. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I have it on DVD. I know I have it on the video cassette, but it was a little hard to come by for a long time because in the actual movie, it's really cool. It's a story about him 
Uh, a little bit kind of goes to the early part, but where it really goes is when he moves down towards Arles, you know, down in the south of France, and he gets a house, and Paul Gauguin comes and lives with him for a while, and then it's about the, it's, a lot of the film is about the latter part of his life down there. But uh, even from the very beginning, because, yep. you know, you, we all think the sunflowers and the bright beautiful yep. flowers, the early stuff, because he was um, Belgian, mm -hmm. um, and from you know, gray country farmer kind of people stuff. He has some amazing drawings going back, which are mostly very dark pictures. Oh, yeah. Of uh, the, I forget what they call the potato eaters, he calls or something. Mm -hmm. And they're having a meal of potatoes and turnips and stuff at the table. Very yeah. poor, dirty people and yeah. stuff. Um, all, it was a really cool film because they had frozen frame copies of the actual paintings and then they would either melt into the film mm. and you could see it become part of real life wow. or you would see the real life stuff going on and it would get frozen into a painting and there's something like 20 at least 27 or something original paintings that they copied out of museums with the film wow. that were the were included in the show mm. and i think there was something about that that made it hard to have access to it, although I don't, I don't think that's still the case. Wow. But if you get a chance, one way or another, to see Lust for Life, yeah, that for me, in terms of things I've seen in my life, that'd definitely be a bucket list one. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe not a super short bucket list, but if you got fifty films or hundred films, you've got to see, definitely, definitely see that. Yeah. So did we do an Eiffel Liberace? Oh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you'll probably creep up in some and later episode. You made the mistake of giving the mic to me to talk. So don't, you know what happens? Don't, don't happens. worry about it. It's it's what we do here. Okay, <laughs> we're okay with this. Okay. Now, um, for some of you that didn't know, uh, Mark reminded me earlier this week that this year, or this this week was actually Gabrielle Foray's birthday. Gabriel yeah. Foray's birthday, so I thought we'd uh, spend some time talking about Gabriel Foray. I brought, I brought. How do they say that in French? They do the same really well, I guess. What is it? Yes, yeah. No, I forget how they do the bon anniversaire. Bon anniversaire. What? Bon anniversaire. Bon, good anniversary. It's oh. their happy birthday. Oh, gotcha. I don't okay. remember how the French sing it. Anyway, so I brought in. Oodles of scores here. Got um, some Dover ones there? Yeah, I got I some Dovers. You got I the Dovers? Got the Dover ones. Both of them? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I recognize the second one. The, uh, yeah, I think I have that. You have this one? You have this one? Yes. Yes, yes you have both. He, he, was a, he was a prolific composer. Oh, yeah, very prolific. I mean, but not as prolific not as Bach. Not yeah. Mozart, but I mean. Definitely hell. not Liszt, but you know. In the 19th century, quite a lot of music. Quite a bit of music in Very there. little of which most of us play. And we, us. Oh, yeah. The French but, still. Play. But you'll be surprised. Much of it is gone. What? Yes. He, his his, his actual his output script? his actual output is much larger than what we thought it was. Today. Even today. So be, by the end of his life, he had gotten rid oh, of he a destroyed lot. It. He destroyed it himself. He found, he found a lot of his works very insignificant and of no credit to his um, you know true talent what you he know, felt Brahms was so. famous for having done that yeah Brahms went to the Rhine took all the letters that Clara had written him, yeah and um, I think approximately 25% of his manuscript output oh gosh and burn it in a pile on the Rhine because he himself was a very famous musical archaeologist. Yeah. He was right. founder of some societies at the time when Schliemann was digging up Troy and Turkey yeah. and finding that it wasn't just a myth, that it was true. Yeah. And uh, Brahms was on the board that served on the first Bach Gesellschaft, the very first yeah. ones to try to find and print all of Bach's known music. Mm -hmm. He was on the advisory board. And he had a huge collection of medieval and Renaissance original scores or copies of things from Baron von Sweeten's library, mm -hmm. who I admit, no. Yeah. Um, he is very conscious of the fact people are going to be digging through my crap when I die yeah. after I'm dead. 
and I want to control the narrative. Exactly. And presumably Fauré did the same thing. Fauré was important. He was the leader of the conservatory for a period of time. Oh, yeah, he was. He was a big figure. One would say uh, perhaps, I mean, some of his music really goes places. But when you compare what Glader Davisy and what Ravel did, yeah. he falls a little bit on the more conservative side. A little bit his more. His language, right? though, yeah. is... I don't, I don't think I've played enough of it. I've played some. I like what I've heard. Okay. But I don't quite get him yet. Maybe yeah. you have more to say about that. Well, you might, want, you might want to look at his work after we talk about okay. it today. <laughs> okay. Um, in case you haven't seen these, uh, for all you uh, piano geeks out there, these are Dover editions of Gabriel Fauré's work. Uh, this Dover's is Nocturne. still in existence. Right? Still publishing. I think so. I'm not sure. It's it hard up. to tell. You can look at yeah, I'll look find it out. But this is a nice fine picture of Gabriel Fauré in this one. It's a nice addition. And this is, uh, what is it? Complete Preludes, Impromptus, and Waltz Caprices. Nice picture. I think that's a Renoir painting with two girls at the piano. Yeah, it is. So, anyways. So, for you folks, you know, I've been really busy this week. I had so much to do this week. I spent, I had to pull an all-nighter last night to uh, get some information on Gabriel Fauré. Now, I have here my cards here of information. Depending on how much you want to know about this guy, I'm going to give you the basics from these cards, but if you want to, for me to go deeper, I have my little... Uh, steno pad here of extra information. I'm not sure how far I want to <laughs> take this because uh, his life was really busy and it was rather chaotic. And I don't know. It was. I'll, I'll let you. I'll. I'll we'll decide how far this goes. Now, uh, his name is. All right. You're gonna have have to help me with the French here. How would you say that? Urbain. 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 It looks like urban, but there's an I in there, so it makes it nasal. Urbain. Okay. Gabriel. Urbain. Urbain. Foray. For. Foray. Foray. Uh. Oh, he let him do uh. it. Okay. The backwards are. Foray. Yeah. All right. It's all right. Foray. Show off. Okay, anyways. He was born on May 12th, 1845 in Palmiers. Ariège. Out of the years. Out of the years, yeah. Uh, well, anyways, it's in southern France, okay? He died in November, no, on November 4th, 1924, at the age of 79. So he lived a pretty good long life. He is the youngest of six children. He had four older brothers, one older sister. And... Miraculously, he is the only musical talent in his family. Mm -hmm. uh, mom, dad, uncles, aunts, cousins showed no evidence of any musical talent, and then he shows up. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, his father was a school teacher, and he had his, his um, well, let's just say, this is where it gets a little bit strange, uh, as far as his um, showing evidence of his musical talent. Uh, they say he there was a uh, church down the street mm -hmm. and he played the organ mm -hmm. and apparently he played the organ well that he actually impressed a lot of the you know the people and the locals much mm -hmm. of the locals. Where did he learn how to play organ? I can't find any any information on that. Um, how did he come to know the instrument or anything about music, there's no information on it. Okay. Um, now the father was a school teacher, his father, and you know, watching his son mess around with the organ, he had, he was, he was sort of a little skeptical. He was about his uh, the level of talent his uh, son displayed, and you know, in defense of the father, Gabriel later on in life said that. He did everything on that organ wrong. 
you know, it was jumbled. He had he had potential technique, but he had bad fingering. He had bad posture. He says he can't say he can't really say that he was a child prodigy of any of any level is what he said later in life. Mm. Now we fast forward a little bit, and okay, there are some history books that say that. Uh, I don't know whether it was due to family hardships and, or finances or what, but he was sent off for four years to live with a foster parent up until he was nine. Mm -hmm. See, that's where it gets a little bit uh, hazy there. Because on one hand, you know, he's playing the organ. He's still that once, you know, some sources say he's still living with his family. But on the other hand, who was this foster parent that he had to live with? for four years. That, and there's no details about what that whole arrangement was about. Now, at nine years old, his talent brought him to the attention of Louis Niedermeyer. Through encouragement, through encouragement of Louis Niedermeyer, he convinced the father to have him sent to a new school that he had opened. It is the school of classical and religious music, mm. so it's and it's a boarding school. Okay, he would be staying there. Um, now, so the father said, "Okay, you know, I mean, since he would, you know, he would encourage his son if, if you know, Louis Niedermeyer, who was who was rather well known for educate music education at the time, you know, he says he, he would be good. Then, by all means." You should set up there. So he goes there, and it is, is the school of classical and religious music. Mm -hmm. Now there, he studies with a Clement. All right, you tell me, Lore. Lore. Mm -hmm. Okay, Clement Lore. He studies organ with Clement Lore. Louis Dietz mm -hmm. for harmony, and Xavier. Wacken Taylor? Wacken Taller. Taller? T H A L E R? Taller. Okay. Wacken okay. Taller. Mm -hmm. uh, for counterpoint. He studies counterpoint. Wow. And he studies with Louis Niedermeyer himself for piano, plain song, and composition. Plain song. Same as Gregorian Chin, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I thought. This is starting to make sense to me now a bit more. Yeah. There's a very strong. Catholic, um, French Catholic background in his music study, music yep. making, which is starting to make a little sense to me. Not that it makes any sense to you, but for how I hear his music and how I know his music. Just in general, there's something gentler. Yes. About Foray's ideas and the way he makes things. Yeah. And also, and especially in his songs, the way he, the poetry that he chooses and the music that he writes. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. That's right. But um, much more inward uh, yes. introspection. introspection. Yeah. Um, the sun is something of a sadness. Sometimes, yeah. So the songs, let me see. There's a um, song called "En Bateau." Uh -huh. the yes, from the sweet. And then, but there's a song. Yeah, yeah. And oh. then, um, so I think it's "En Bateau" or something "Bateau," but it, you know, it's a, almost like the Viennese Cardinal song. Yeah, Mendelssohn's, you know, those right. things. But no, it's a piece about the water being in the water and stuff. I don't think they're the same poetry, and. There's a famous song by Toll of Gabriel Foray in songs. Oh. It's uh, very plaintive. Uh, you know, plaintive. Uh, kind of a calling out in a quiet, personal, emotional way that's a little sad, you know? Yeah. Something that I kind of think with his music. I played the C minor uh, piano quartet. Yeah. And I think about the slow movement. Mm -hmm. 
dum. The way that the melody moves through the instruments and comes up and through and the kind of climax. It's uh, music that can make you weep. Oh, yeah. There's absolutely. some aspect to it. And it's happy music. Well, let's put it this way. What I find missing in Foray where I think a lot of composers will find their way back to him mm -hmm. as an inspiration. Yeah. There's not an ounce of Beethoven in Foray. No, you're not going to find There's that. There's nothing of that character, the drive, the structure, even the way the melodies are constructed or anything like that. And I'm not saying that all music has to be that way. But I do think, of course, if you look at any of the German composers, Everybody, as Dr. Walter said, had Beethoven's Beethoven. fault. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, yeah. you had to match up to that. Berlioz took it to heart in yeah. his own kind of way. Well, more on that later. Okay, <laughs> but um, yeah. there's nothing in there with Foray. And I think that it comes probably from this church thing. So that's my little, what do you call commentary? Yeah, the, yeah the exactly. Go ahead. All right. Well, anyway. So he stayed so, with all these different teachers. He stayed, he stayed with all these different teachers. And during his stay there, upon uh, graduating, he had won all these prizes at the school, including first prize in composition for this choral work called Cantique de Jean Racine. Cantique de Jean Racine, yeah. Opus 11, which is now pretty much a mainstay in the choral repertoire. Oh, yeah. So, apparently. So um, he graduated as a laureate, organ, piano, harmony, composition, with a, all right, you tell me how you say that. Maître means master. Maître de chapelle, the master of the chapel. Okay, a diploma, mm -hmm. basically is what that was. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, he himself was a teacher. His most notable students, Ravel, Georges Enescu, huh. and the Boulanger sisters. They also, well, I know they studied with Foray. I did not know that Enescu, yeah. Georges Enescu studied with Foray. Foray, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. But th that's just a small roster. There were others. So, but uh, now, how, do, how much farther do you want to deep, uh, dig deep with this guy? This oh, guy. Well, I think we spent a long time talking about Liberace. We should balance it out with this fellow. All right, sure thing. <laughs> All right. So, Gabriel Fauré, he's sort of confusing. Um, he's finding jobs teaching piano lessons. He's a piano teacher, mm. uh, which he, did, he didn't really like doing. And he's also playing organ at churches, which. Once again, he didn't really like doing that either. What he really wanted to do was be a composer. Mm -hmm. But since uh, making a living was really a necessity at the time, he really didn't find time to be able to sit down and compose something. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to work out things with churches, uh, the pastors of some of these churches questioned his level of you know, commitment That's to the true. Catholic faith. And so I, I remember reading one story where he showed up for Sunday Mass still wearing the party clothes <laughs> that he was wore, wearing since Friday night. Ooh. So apparently, you know, the man got around partying with his buddies and pals. Don't you think he went a lot like Greek? Yeah, a little bit. They both had the big muscles. A little bit, right? yeah. So, oh, by the way, um, Sometime during his stay at that school, uh, Niedermeyer passes away, and Sasson takes over. Hmm. And apparently Sasson recognizes this kid, Foray, as having some talent, and pretty much takes him under his wing. Uh -huh. And so they become really good friends. And, you know, it would be no surprise to me that maybe there was some influence from Sasson, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I mean, from... Knowing some of his music, because I've, I've looked at some of Sasson's music, and basically I see no resemblance. Uh, the foray no, that I, I, had more of a poetic temperament, but Sasson's—I'm sorry, his music is for the virtuoso. There's so many notes in it. 
Well, and that probably speaks to how perhaps truly great an instrumentalist Sasson was versus Foray. Yeah. I mean, perhaps. Because, I mean, Sasson, I thought it was amazing that uh, Tchaikovsky as a young man, yeah. when I bought that uh, old Tchaikovsky recording that yeah. I talked about this previous show, yeah. the very first piece on the CD is some kind of, I forget what, it's a very fast piece by Sasson. I said so. And, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a guy. He also was a great represent, representative yeah. of that French school, very clean and precise. Uh -huh. And yeah, kind of that. like fast seed. Yeah. You know, when it's easy kind yeah. of way of playing and throwing things off. Um, uh, you know, Rubenstein mentions it a little bit in his biography. Yeah, my young years. Yeah, in the first book, when he talks about, he was a big Wagner guy. Mm -hmm. you know, and went to some performances at Bayreuth when he was younger uh, in the late 19th century, early 20s, is right around there. But I thought he went with Paul Kochansky, as Polish mm -hmm. violin for them yeah. together. Then he met Emmy Destine, I think, once one or another mm -hmm. down there. Um, but he talks about, in, in all of that, at what an influence Wagner was in terms of truly establishing what could be considered a German orientation towards music, mm -hmm. the German way to make music and all of that stuff versus, for example, the French. And of course, Davies at the time was making fun of uh, Wagner's yeah. Gallywalk's Cake yeah, Bar, right? Yeah. You know? uh, he also, Tristan and Isolde, so, he used the chord yeah. as a um, and with Sanson, well, both of them, I think, is like very French. Oh, yeah. You know, Sanson is perhaps because of the virtuosity, yeah, been taken on by the people, even in Dave Hurwitz's mm -hmm. crushing review yeah. of the yeah, of, I know. Uh, Young Long Long's uh, recent release, yeah. uh, Sanson, uh, yeah, all that. Rubenstein's first, I mean, he played the A major concerto, the yeah. big, more popular one, but, uh, of Mozart, but his first concerto as a teenager, I guess it was 16 or something. Something like that. that. Was the sense of G minor. Yeah. That was what he called his true war, true war horse. He yeah. played those in public before he did the Chopin concerto. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, but definitely two different schools. And I think also... Uh, foray, it's interesting because there's the plain chant uh, and there's the counterpoint, and I think there is the very French Catholic tradition of music making, mm -hmm. which is not German and Bach and Protestant. No, it's not. The way even though they play the organs and stuff. Because César Franck has a certain kind of quality to the way he plays it. You know, he had a few chants and he's a big yeah. boy. And, was a fabulous organist, and you could see that. Yeah. Also, even in the style of music, you read preludes, chorales, and fugues, mm -hmm. but not in a Bachish kind of way. It doesn't have quite the same yeah. thing. Saison comes from also clearly a more classical period. The guy was born in 1835, I think. Yeah. Died in 19, early 20s, something mm -hmm. like that. Almost, well, maybe in his 90s or getting on it before he died. He's also Leopold Kodowski's only known piano teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think he he went back so far that there was a very strong, still classic key mm -hmm. kind of orientation to music making back in the day. And he talked this book, if I get a chance to talk about it, I'll okay, sure. today or not, but um, Kalkbrenner, wasn't it? Kalkbrenner, yeah, France. Very famous pianist <laughs> in Paris, who when Chopin arrived, <laughs> Offered to teach him for a year and turn him into a real concert pianist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, but Kalkbrenner and some of those people are actually credited with probably establishing what was known as and became the French school. Yeah. They kind of started the whole thing, the French Conservatory, and a certain kind of way of playing, which was at least into the First World War area, era as we've learned from recordings, 
was a truly different kind of school and tradition and way of playing that definitely there was a Russian school of some sort that I established by Salati and mm -hmm. Rubinstein. And then there's the German schools. Mm -hmm. And then there was Liszt, as French kind of school. the king of all of that stuff, who would have influenced people in different ways. But anyway, I got on oh, my okay. commentary thing here again. Hey, please keep going. This is okay. interesting. All right, sure thing. But right. I was particularly taken with all this stuff you've been saying. I'm starting to get a sense for why his music is the way it is. Yeah. I love it when people, I heard uh, some people play it really well and do a wonderful job. And some things I like to play. I like his songs. I yeah. like accompanying his songs. Sure. But some of his stuff is a little odd in terms of melodies. Yeah, exactly. Okay. There's a reason for that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's a reason we'll get for all that. Well, I'm getting to okay. it. Okay. All right. So anyways, he had all these ideas about composition, but he couldn't, he couldn't find the time to sit down because people always wanted him as an administrator or a teacher, yes. you know, and he, he was, was well loved. He, yes, he, he was, was well loved. His students, his yeah. students would die for him. They loved him. You know, um, D W C Ravel, all these other guys who were starting to rep, wanted to bring music to more update to the future. Um, he supported that. He said he was. They said this guy was very open minded. And if you notice, you know. Some of his music, you said it was kind of, some of it, You, it's hard to understand what he, where he's going at, what direction he's trying to go. There's a reason for that. He was, Some of his compositions he brought to the Paris Conservatory, and they were astonished by how modern it looked, because he didn't resolve certain, like, oh. antecedent phrases. You know, because, um, all right, in, pra in common practice, uh, as far as composition goes, you're the first, one of the first things you're taught is about the period, the antecedent phrase and the consequent phrase. Right. Cadence, right? right? Perfect authentic cadence at the end. Right. Um, his music is not like that. Um, his music is organized in phrase groups. And, you know, and oh. whether where the period really is, we don't know sometimes. It's because uh, because you have these unexpected chord changes and you know, another chord appears and it, bring, it brings in a new, whole new digression of music that's somehow supposed to relate with the first part, you know, the first phrase group. But in, since he probably presumed to be a serious yeah. composer, do you know what the logic or the rationale is for why he wrote his music that way? Well, because he was open to the idea of moving towards the future. Now, look, he loved Wagner. Okay, he adored Wagner's music. As a matter of fact, he uh, he would make plans in his calendar uh, where to travel to for the next production of um, whatever uh, Wagner opera was being performed. Mm -hmm. Guess what his favorite opera was? Parsifal. Parsifal. Yeah, of course. His favorite opera was it's the Marcival. most religious of all of them. Yeah, yeah. and so and, and he saw every attempt any time he heard a word where Parsifal was playing he. Put it in his calendar, people, to see if he could go. Well, you know why? There. Because when Wagner wrote that, it was his last opera, and it was premiered at Bayreuth. Uh, for thirty years, that was the only place you could hear it. So until after the First World War, yeah, um, ish, yeah, some around that. So I think after it expired, they had yeah. a legal control over it. Yeah, um, so, and then Metropolitan. Yeah. I don't know who else may have done it else in the world, but Metropolitan, of course, did the first um, public performance at Parsifal in New York in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then Toscanini, as I talked about in the previous show, 1930, was hired to go to Bayreuth. I put some pictures up of him and Siegfried mm -hmm. and all that. Yeah. I think uh, he'd arrived just after because uh, Cosima died in April uh, 1930. Yeah. And it's about two months before the whole summer festival really yeah. gets moving. Um, and it was uh, Toscanini who had an original score with what they called the Grausglocke, mm -hmm. which is kind of like a strung instrument, actually, but it's almost like it's banged. It's like if you had a huge bass string and it's uh, 
struck uh, yeah. almost like a bell and make it boom, boom. Yeah. You could do the same effect on a Steinway if you lift up the dampers mm -hmm. and you could hit it, but probably pluck it as well. Yeah. And you get this kind of wah, kind of sound. Yeah. For whatever reason, I don't know why, but in the rehearsal, there was no grouse clucking. And I don't know if the tradition had just kind of gone away and they didn't use it or somebody had decided at some point we don't want to use it. The space, even to this very day, under the stage where the orchestra sits, and you get uh, 45, 50 of them down there. I don't know if it's any more than that. Yeah. It's hot. I mean, come on, some of these operas go on three, four, five hours. Exactly. Those guys are not in... Uh, They're not wearing tails down there. Yeah. It's hotter now. And there's no air conditioning because uh, the noise would affect things, you know. Um, I think it's very possible the girls' clock might have been. We need more room. <laughs> 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 or maybe the tuba player during that certain period of time was big boy. Yeah. And we don't get any room for the girls. <laughs> <laughs> but Toscanini's the one that asked about it and demanded that they find that because it was in the original it score. Yeah. So it was um, the Americans who brought back the original traditional parts of home. Wow. I did not know he was a follower because okay. Davis was decidedly not. Yes, WC was not. Davis is a bit younger than Frey, now, but Oh, it goes even more extreme than just not being a Wagner. Yeah. Right. Because years later, um, there was a push. I don't know if it was due to World War I or something, but there was a big push to uh, have Wagner's music and work blackballed completely from Paris Conservatory. And guess who was the leading, uh, who was the leader of that group? Davis. No. Sassas. Sassas? Sassas led the, led the lead to have um, Wagner um, blackballed at Paris Conservatory. They would not hear another note of Wagner until 1930. Wow. 1930. And guess who Guess who uh, brought him back? Foray. Foray did. Foray. Well, they, both of them would have been old guys when they did that. Yeah. Well, because he, he says song. Well, he died. Like first World War, it makes sense. Yeah. Because there was something like 50,000 minimum French young men mm -hmm. who were killed in the trenches. I saw a movie one time. Yeah. It's about the First World War. It's a very interesting little mm -hmm. uh, series of films about the First World War. And you always, you know, you, everybody thinks about the mustard gas and the trench warfare. Yeah. Well, I never realized it wasn't like trench warfare, like all over Europe and everywhere else. Infamously, it was an area where there's a, what they said, something like 10 square miles uh, on, on, in France mm -hmm. across the border. But it's like, uh, what was it, two miles wide, five miles deep, mm -hmm. with all these trenches dug in. And for at least two or three years, that isn't the only place they had battles, but that was one of the places. And British were there as well. Sometimes they make an advance, they get pushed back. Mm -hmm. for, can you imagine that? For two or three years, they were fighting over... 20 square feet. What is 20 square? I'm sorry. What is 20 square feet? I mean, I know. here in Columbus, like, what does that mean? And that was the chunk of the war. But yeah. it, it had a profound effect on France yeah. because there's so many young men. And you know, the thing about World War One, it was a big nationalistic time. Yeah. All the nation, young nation states, the later 19th century to identify yeah. themselves and everybody was proud to be this, proud to be that, and do yeah. this and that, and then they sided up with each other with the treaties. And the people just signed up. Yeah. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna fight because you know I'm leaving my nation, my country, and everything. I think that between World War One and uh, the Spanish flu mm -hmm. 
I think it's possible that there's a minimum of 50 million casualties, deaths, between those things. Now, I think maybe it was bigger than 50,000. It must have been a bigger number. It had to have been. Because Gettysburg and the Civil War eventually, I think in the Civil War in the United States, there have been 750,000 people, boys, mostly killed. But what happened in France was, yeah, a lot of the guys that went to fight were young men. Yeah. You know, the British have made a lot of movies about. Yeah. I saw an um, interesting film that was done uh, not so long ago. Yeah. Who's the guy who wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? C.S. Lewis, C.S. Right? Lewis, yeah. He was for a period of time in the trenches in World War yeah. He got badly injured, and yeah. then they sent him back. He got shell shock or something knocked out. No, he didn't leave right away. He stayed. He stayed, but had some buddies that had died, and it's a really cool movie. Yeah. I forget what it's called, but you can look it up, and I, I don't, I think we watched it on something free. Okay. Um, but it's a movie about C.S. Lewis and his early, like before he wrote the whole Witch and yeah. the stuff and all that. But you see, especially the British lost a lot of guys, too. Americans, thank God, we didn't get involved oh, until 1917, and within 11, 12, 13 months, it was all over. Yeah. Because the American industry went and kicked ass, and we just yeah. finished it. So there were doughboys that lost their yeah. lives. But France was so devastated by the loss of all those men yeah. that the Paris Conservatory began to admit women, yeah. which they had not done. Now, some women had studied. Like the Boulanger sisters, for example, but it, but this put it this way it was very uncommon to have that many of them in the in the school. There's a famous girl from Boston who was a child prodigy who eventually went and studied there. Oh, her, uh, yeah, I know. Half, half a CD of her play, um, and then in addition to that, from the First World War forwards, the school began to hire piano professors who were not French, French yeah. and not necessarily of the French tradition. Mm -hmm. And so I think there still is a kind of Frenchy kind of way of playing. We talked about that with Johnny Thibaudet. Yeah. Hamelin in a sense, I mean, Thibaudet though even more so. Yeah. There's a certain just, just facility so, the way that he yeah. plays. Hamelin's is perhaps a little bit more Extraordinary, plus yeah. there is Godowski and stuff like yeah. that. But I just remember Johnny Thibaudet often being considered a very French yeah. kind of approach so to play. Yeah, feathery. Yeah, I mean, just the the, the, the stuff it tosses it off with grace. Exactly, that's originally part of that tradition. Yeah, but um, it all had to change because they lost so many yeah. guys. But then it gave the girls a chance to show themselves and. Corto had been taught by Louis Dieme. Yeah. I don't know how you say his name. Is Dieme, or Dieme. Dieme, or I'm not sure. Or if it's even. No, I think the I is Die. But um, he was a, a, a long term influence in the Paris yeah. Conservatory in the 19th century. Corto was studied with him. And then quite a number of people studied with Corto. A lot of women as well studied yeah. with him. And he may have passed along certain kind of traditions. I think I told you, I mean, finally worked news on my CDs yeah. in that tower. A while back, and I don't know if it's ever appeared on the show, one of those many Beethoven sonata collections I have is Eve Nacht. Yes. Y-V-E-S-N-A-T. It's a very famous mid-century French pianist. It's very interesting to hear his Beethoven. And it's a different kind of playing. It's very impressive. Yeah, Very sure interesting, is. but... Now we on camp for sure. It's a little different, but anyway, I got off on that's okay. Talk that's okay. but this is really fascinating because oh. I I'm learning or maybe putting things together about foray that I yeah. never got. So, anyways, yeah, even from the grave, he died in 1924, mm. and like I said, Paris Conservatory would not hear another note of Wagner's mm. until 1930. And he um, written something about it. Yeah, he did. Um, now, the interesting thing about his, near the end of his life, mm -hmm. okay, um, like it was less 60 when he was born, something like that. I'm sorry? Like 1860 or something. He was born in 1846. Whoa, 46. Okay. So he lived to be nearly 80. Okay. Yeah. 
okay, so he was 79. Uh -huh. Now, during that time, he was seeing a 24-year-old girl. Where? <laughs> when he was like in his final years. French guys, you know. Yeah, so, but I, I told you. Monsieur, you, you must have tickles my face. <laughs> tickles my face. <laughs> and when you're down there, it just tickles me so much. Oh, God. You might have to cut that part. Oh, yeah. We always put this show is not for kids. Oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> but like I said, the uh, the students loved him. They yeah. adored him. Yes. Okay. Um, the younger kids, the younger students, uh, you know, they all liked Wagner. Okay. It was the uh, faculty and, you know, the older generation of composers that sought to, you know. You know, there was. Have a black ball. I mean, the French and the Germans had a historic problems for centuries. Yeah. Um, you know, Heidelberg Castle, which is famously part of its ruin, yeah. that goes back to the 1600s when it was destroyed, parts of it, and it was never put back together. Yeah. It's not like that happened in the 20th century. The French did that yeah. when they invaded. The French were always invading Germany. And then Napoleon came along with this and that. It was really probably Napoleon which was the last straw began to be a nationalist movement yeah. to organize a German state, which didn't come until later in the 19th century um, through, um, what was his name? Not Hindenburg, but the guy, what did he say? Bismarck. Um, but there was the Franco-Prussian War, they called it, yeah. 1870-71. That was relatively fresh in the memory of people. And what the French weren't prepared for, because previously, in the earlier times, the 1830s, 1840s, Napoleonic period, and nobody beat Napoleon right away. Yeah. And the French would come and do some crap. And the reason that the Germans were so uh, vulnerable was there were all these little Germanic states, sometimes just city-states. Or I mean, going back to the medieval period, um, and the, they were only unified in a sense kind of by dialectic language similarities. Yeah. And maybe... There wasn't even necessarily a true racial German like sense of connectivity. Yeah. So we'll talk about that another time because I know a lot of history about that. But the French were a little bitter about the Franco Prussian War because, you know, the Alsace Lorraine area mm -hmm. of France yeah. is kind of a German French culture. Yeah. Sure the, the cuisine, the language itself mm -hmm. is a little odd, and some of the cultural traditions is going back and forth. And they lost that after the war for that next period of time along with Germany. And uh, so it was in the 1870s, you think thinking that Wagner's really starting to come to the fore in that decade. That's when the ring starts to show up. And, yeah. um, uh, definitely with the French. There were yeah. some bad feelings about it. And then with World War One, that was devastating for because so much of that war happened in French territory. Yeah. So, uh, I'm going to skip a lot of his personal I'm life. Talking, I'm talking too much. No, you're not talking too much. No, not because of that. I mean, but if you want to know about more of his personal life, the man was a the man was a stud. Okay, I mean, he was he he was married, he had a, yeah he was married he was married but he was a Frenchman but he was a Frenchman <laughs> he had many mistresses I mean he was. Yeah, he was. He got it going. I mean, old school. But anyways, um, I like to. I like to fast forward to the things he did for the Paris Conservatory, mostly because it was it was quite a turning point for that school. He shook up that conservatory in a big way, particularly in uh, the manner they did or competitions, and particularly in the way they treated. Maurice Ravel. Mm. Now, as you know, Maurice Ravel had been trying to win the Prix de Rome many times. Um, it was the sixth time that he tried for the Prix de Rome that um, that caught Gabriel Fauré's attention because during the first rounds, he was already eliminated. They didn't want to listen to Ravel's music. Mm. Okay, and he thought that was kind of suspicious that they would just automatically turn down Ravel. 
And so he discovered that the judges, in a lot of ways, had this political thing going on where they would give first priority and special treatment for their students. And they were being paid off. And so Gabriel Faure decided to institute policies to eliminate that and have outside judges from the Comparis Conservatory to be uh, judging competitions and auditions and things. Mm. And that shook them up because these people, these, these faculty members who were judging all these competitions, mm. they were being paid extra to be judges. Mm. And so when that went away, there was a hoo-ha <coughs> and everybody was like ticked off and they wound up, some, most, most of them wound up leaving, particularly Masane. Masane was probably his biggest uh, nemesis and rival at the conservatory because in a lot of ways, Masane, from reading what, from what I've done from some reading, he had a very high opinion of himself. He sought to be, what? Yeah, that guy. Mm -hmm. He sought to be uh, the leader of the music department at Paris Conservatory, but he wanted to be a lifetime office. He says, and uh, he didn't like Foray. And, you know, once Foray became, you know, their chairman, their leader, mm. and he was instituting policies, he just got up and left, not to be seen again. Yeah. So, now, um, concerning World War One, he enlisted. He enlisted for military services. Um, he loved France, and uh, he was involved in several operations on the siege of different um, locales in France. Um, eventually, after he was discharged, uh, the streets were so violent and bloodied that he just had to leave. And um, his musical circles all wound up planning to meet up again in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And in Switzerland, remember his old school, the school of um, classical and religious music? Mm -hmm. Well, they reopened a new school in Switzerland. And that's where they all met, mm -hmm. was over there. And once again, Tassos was there to lead the group. And well, that whole thing with uh, Germany, uh, had uh, foray. I mean, he loved he loved the musicians and the composers that he uh, was uh, that was in the group. But he could not see himself being against Wagner's music. Mm -hmm. You know, he just he didn't see Wagner as a German, the enemy or anything. He just looked at Wagner as the composer. Mm -hmm. You know, and so. He, he just wound up washing his hands to the whole thing. Now, we come to the string quartet. The string quartet is Opus 120, 121 or 128. I can't remember the last digit. It would be his final work. And he had been, you know, people had asked him about, why don't you do a string quartet? You've done all these other things. Do a string quartet. Mm -hmm. um, the two things he had problems with was doing symphony work, he was not confident about doing symphony work simply because he was not, you know, he was not confident with his skills and being able to manipulate sounds and instruments, you know, in the group. Mm -hmm. And so he tended to avoid doing that, with the exception of the requiem. The right. requiem. It took him twenty years to complete the work. Mm -hmm. Twenty years. So that it was a very slow process. Mm -hmm. And so his final hurdle was to complete a string quartet. Now, what he says, he, it's interesting you say that Beethoven's cojones yeah, yeah. Uh, hanging over everybody's head. He looks at it as, this is, this is Beethoven's domain. Mm -hmm. What right do I have to, you know, to enter this domain where he has already ruled? Mm -hmm. you know, and so that was his biggest problem. And so he sort of hesitantly and with great trepidation tried to complete this string quartet which winds mm -hmm. up being you know actually part of the, uh, the rep string
string quartet repertoire, yeah. ironically. Yeah. And it would be his final uh, works, piece. his final piece. Mm. Um, incidentally, I said that he did enlist in the military before he passed away. Um, he was actually honored for his services in the military during World War One, really? and was awarded the um, uh, what is it? The Legion of Croix de Guerre. Um, Cross of War. Yeah, the Cross of War. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was awarded that for his uh, services. Wow. So the man was a soldier. Uh, but so, how much of his music have you played? Are you done with the biography? I'm pretty much done with that. How much of his really now, good? Now, I'll tell you what. This was nice. The most, the most I've done about four A. Uh, I I've done the elegy for cello and piano. Mm-hmm. Uh, countless times. I mean, when I was in high school, we had so many strings, you know, in yeah, Bowling Green it. and Finley, Ohio, that you know, when we went to contest, there was there was going to definitely be two or three cellists that are going to want to play Foray's Elegy, which I mm-hmm. did dutifully. And so, mm-hmm. and you know, anytime a cellist wanted to play the Elegy, yeah. you know, says, "Oh, go to Elmer, go to Elmer. He plays mm-hmm. it. He plays it every year." Mm-hmm. So sure mm-hmm. enough, I, you know, I had to play. Um, I had to play for his elegy. Um, the only other, uh, the only other time I've ever delved into foray was mm-hmm. doing was when I first listened to Leonard Pinario's recording of the Pavon. You remember the Pavon? Yeah, there's uh, two. There's Ravel's Pavon, uh, and then there's this Foray's. Foray's Pavon. Yeah. yeah, it's actually a beautiful work. Mm-hmm. I like this work. Yeah, uh, I'm sure most of you know it, but it it hasn't. It's been silent for the last few uh, couple, two or three decades now. Nobody's Nobody it. plays it. I, I don't even hear orchestra. But um, the recording I heard was from Pinario, mm. and it was actually his arrangement of the work that he usually performs. Oh. Um, he's he he looked more into the orchestra score, mm. and you know just sort of whittled out his own uh, arrangement. Now, what he did not know was Gabriel Faure's Pavan was originally for piano. And for a while, it was not available until, I'm going to guess, somewhere in the 1980s. This is the Roy Howitt edition. And it's quite nice. If you go on YouTube, we actually have um, an old Belta Mignon uh, recording of Foray himself playing this work. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a yum da 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 di adam da di adi da da da. It's a beautiful piece. It's an awkward, gorgeous work. But, um, I've dabbled with this work before. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, you know, it's an abstract mind. It's, yeah. it's it's a pavan, of course, so it's supposed yeah. to be sad. It's a dance. It's wonderfully sad. Yeah. Yeah, it is a dance. But I mean that melody. Yeah, I know. It's magical. (laughs) It's kind of well, almost makes it through the octave. It goes up. It passes the B coming back down. But it's basically within a minor sixth. Yeah. F sharp, G sharp, A. B A G sharp E A F sharp G sharp A G sharp F sharp G sharp E F sharp E sharp C sharp. Yeah. It's and it's a very memorable melody. It's it, it it speaks so directly. Yeah. So you played this. Yeah, I I, I dabbled with it. I I dabbled. Oh, with you never performed it for I anybody. I never performed it for anybody. Oh. Um, but. I would love to. I mean, I'd love to open the... Uh, How's the melody go for the Ravel? Da, let's see. Da, 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 I like the melody of the foray better. Yeah. It's more right to the point. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing something very funny recently. I don't know where I saw it. So I was talking about when Ravel 
heard somebody perform it. Yeah. Perform this? No, the, his his pavan for a dead princess. Yeah. yeah. He said, "You know, this is supposed to be a pavan for a dead princess, not a dead pavan for a princess." <laughs> oh God! Oh, jeez! Oh, oh! To remind the guy that you know, this is truly a dance. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it is. It does have. To, but uh, you can hear sometimes and I think that's a little slow, slow. it is slow because the accompaniment in the orchestra and it's also using the piano he marks his staccato with the left hand and it's not going to be you know yeah. Dry as a bone, yeah. Southwestern desert staccato, but but it's supposed to be plucked. Yeah, it's plucked staccato, and it's yeah. bum 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 bum. There's a slightly forward move in the dance, yeah. which wants to keep it going. Wants to move forward the trajectory of the phrases, yeah. And I, I, I have heard, dong ding dong ding dong ding dong ding dong ding dong ding dong. You lose me before you're out of the first measure, you know. Yeah. So what all we got here? Okay. You showed in the code books. All right. Now. But you got the pavan. Yes. Now, for all you big time super virtuoso wannabes. Oh. Okay, this is quite possibly Foray's most ambitious work for the piano. Um, it started out as a solo piano work, and he must have liked it so much oh, I know. that he would eventually arrange it for piano and orchestra. orchestra. I've got the performance on the the uh, you do? Set tapes you that did, I've been Yeah, you did. This is Foray's Ballad in Opus 19. What's for the song? piece that uh, is also considered Davies's concerto? Is it not the, the same fantasy? Name? Fantasia. The, it's a fantasy. Yeah, the the WC fantasia for, for piano, piano and orchestra. orchestra. It's a C major. Yeah. So the ballad is foray. This is ballad foray, mm. this, and this this sucker is an F sharp major. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of sharps. Take a look at this. Uh, this is a uh, uh, published by International Music Company, edited by the American pianist Grant Johansson. Ooh, Grant Johansson, I have a, a double CD of him playing a whole bunch of French music. Yes. He was yes. really quite respected by the French people yeah. for his devotion to the French school of piano playing. Yes. It took me three days to get through this entire score. <laughs> three days. I mean, the sum of it was just so... It's it's difficult. It's so contrapuntally complex and just oh, all this the is, leading around. And, uh, this is the original for piano solo. It was originally for piano solo. Uh, and like I said, he must have liked it so much that he that he arranged it for piano and orchestra. Now um, it must be noted that Foray was also a first class organist. He eventually became a first class organist, and had he wanted to. He could have had a career as a concert organist, but he didn't want to play the organ. He said, according to one of his uh, colleagues, he once said that the organ just does not create the kind of nuances he wants to be expressive in his music, is what he said. And so that's why he stuck to the piano, because he was able to get what he wanted of the piano. You know, I, I'm an so, organist. My dad was a really great organist. Um, yeah, um, and I studied for a year. It was a requirement to have a second instrument at mm -hmm. Wittenberg, very Germanic kind of school thing. So I studied piano, but then I studied uh, organ and harpsichord for three total trimesters uh, with Trudy Faber, who herself was a student yeah. of Gustav Leonhardt. And I did an organ recital. Not a full one, but I yeah. played with other students, did some pieces. I was really impressed one time, because when my father and mother first met, Mom pretended 
to need organ lessons, and she went to the music store where Dad was teaching oh. in order to take organ lessons with him. She was already an adept organist playing at the Methodist Church. Oh, oh, sneaky. Yeah. Well, I remember this Takata, I forget who it was by. It's a pre, pre Bach, pre jazz Bach, but it wasn't Froberger, that's too far back, but there's somebody in between there. Okay. I remember, but. Two new books that did Mom climbed up on the organ at, yeah. at home that yeah. Dad had. This big con four manual uh -huh. theater, but it could sound like a pipe organ. Yeah. Um, it was electronic. But he also always had external pipes connected to it. Uh -huh. It was a big deal. I just was blown away. I, I knew that mom had played organ in church, but, and I, you know, she was an adept pianist. Yep. And a cousin of hers had studied at Indiana a long time ago and was equally famous as a concert pianist and concert violinist. Her name was Jenkins. That was the mom's maiden name. Uh, I never seen my mom play. <laughs> really, and I'm still thinking about it now. Yeah. She climbed up on the organ. Yeah. She said, "Let me take the music," and she put it up there. She sight read my recital. <laughs> 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 So I mean, I got I got the music in my blood from both of my parents, clearly. Yeah. But the extraordinary thing to me about mom was, she never sat down and played the piano. She never played the organ. And I mean, I was the oldest kid, so I remember the farthest back. Right. I just remember oddly, I came up from Woodbury. I said, I've got to prepare this piece, and I'm, I still am trying to figure out what how to use the stops and do certain things because it was yeah. still new to me. I said, well, let's see it. She climbed up on the bench, and she turned some things on, and poof! <laughs> the whole thing. Side read the sucker. <laughs> With the feet going through. <laughs> and the feet the thing is, you know, I'm, a bit, I'm not a klutz. I'm better yeah. than I used to be. I'm starting to get eyes, especially in my left foot. Yeah. You know, I can pretty much, I'd say I've got 85, minimum 85% accuracy all the time. Okay. It's better if I watch. Well, I would love to see the look but, on your face when your mom did that. <laughs> I mean, I'm still thinking about that. Just that yeah. moment in my mind that sticks out. Wow. What was this woman capable of? I know she was smart. Yeah. She was an intense reader. Yeah. She had a choice between watching TV or reading. She'd go read a read book. book. Big yeah. time. She was the one that encouraged us when we were kids, especially in the summer when we were in school. She'd take us to the library. And uh, she had this kind of rule. You can borrow as many books as you want, given how many the library that you take, which was pretty significant. Yeah. It's a, it's a dozen books. But, she said, in two weeks, we're going to have to bring them back. You can't renew them. You need to read them. Mm -hmm. So whatever you can read within the two weeks, um, you can take as many as you want, but just make sure you read them all. <laughs> we kids, we three kids, go. it was a big deal. Oh, yeah. Dad worked hard and he was relatively well paid as a middle level. He was a union guy, but he worked uh, more in supervision and supervisory stuff at the International Harvester. We had a nice home and you know, we had birthday presents and Christmas presents and things, but I'd say we were somewhere in the middle of the middle mm -hmm. class. Yeah. We never went on like big vacations mm -hmm. or stuff like that, and we were warned for scholarships and grants and fellowships and things like that, but I've never gone through college. Um, because Dad didn't have enough to put away. And then Mom worked later on for many years. About the time I was in fifth grade, I think she got her first mm -hmm. job out of it. But um, she took us to the library and she actually took us on a vacation one time. We went to SeaWorld and we went to Stan Hewitt Hall mm -hmm. in Akron. You know that place? Yes, I've heard of it. It was the home that was owned by the uh, tire magnet. Not the super famous tires, but the other name that begins with the same letter. They were made up in Akron. Okay. It was a really cool house. But Kyrowski had played the piano in their house. Ooh. He signed the, he signed signed it? the inside of the piano. Holy That's John Kyrowski. Uh, 
Um, Mom took us for things like that. And she was, I mean, I had issues with Mom very much so. Mm -hmm. It was not a, it was an abuse, physically punishing abusive relationship. I know now that my mom Probably no more. She's bipolar, and more on the depression than the manic side most of the time. And I don't know what happened to her. I think she may have been. I don't know where it happened or how it happened, but sexually abused or violated earlier yeah. in her life. So she's a, a wounded person, and I was there first and around with the longest. And my father was chose to be absent in order to avoid conflict in the house. So he worked second shift a lot as we were kids, went home the evening. And I probably took the brunt of mother, mom's bad moments and rage and things. It was pretty bad. I worked my way through it. You don't need to play any violins or anything for me. I, I think that the kind of person I am is interestingly because I turned those lemons into Sunshine yeah. Lemonade. Right. Aspects of my character and my compassion, I think, was very, runs very deep in me. My sympathy or even empathy for uh, abused and wounded people, mm -hmm. troubled people. So I've chosen to accept it as uh, I was being in a situation and the recipient of a very wounded person's suffering. But on the other hand, in the good times, all of the intellectual and cultural and musical kinds of things. And, I mean, Dad was a trained musician, but he couldn't do it professionally. But he did play for the church and different things like that. But um, really, his mom. I mean, I love books. Oh yeah, I love going to museums and all that kind of stuff. I, 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 I I'm never bored. Because, oh my God, I could pull anything off the shelf here just just to have a free moment. Oh, I just don't want to read a little bit about this. You know? If you do get bored, on a five page paper. There you go. <laughs> I don't, I'm sorry, how did I get into that? I don't remember. But oh, I was about the organ stuff. Yeah, the organ. Yeah, so I played the organ, but oh, I know what I was going to say. And I'm now the, interestingly, the organist at a Lutheran church here in Columbus. Um, that's relatively new in my life. I right. did a lot of piano, a lot of opera, a lot of theater, uh, choral directing, all that kind of stuff. And near the older part of my life, I became an organist. And occasionally I play the piano. There are some of the more conservative Lutheran congregations, so they like the organ. Yeah. And I've gotten used to it because the emphasis for them is really the sacrament. It's mm -hmm. a big deal. Yeah. And it's, it's the culmination of the whole thing. The, the sermon kind of leading towards that, but then there's the whole sacrament. Um, but occasionally I'll play the piano, and then sometimes they like that, actually, when I do it. But I've really learned the organ, when I play the organ, I feel like I'm conducting an orchestra, pulling out voices yeah. and things like that. And there's a certain verticality of music. I don't mean boring. There always needs to be a trajectory and a line of music. Right. But I mean more like straight strum pianos versus cross strum mm -hmm. pianos. Okay? You have that kind of clarity in those different, depending on what stops you choose and things like that. Whereas the piano, I can be like Monet. Mm -hmm. Not to smear it, but to create impressions or suggestions or different aspects of a color that you can do with the piano that uh, I don't get. The organ is a little bit more timbre yeah. and color specific. And it's kind of like what you've got. Yeah. That's it. That's what you've got. Yeah. Piano is instantaneous. You yeah. can change things as quickly as you are able to, given your yeah. abilities. And, uh, I appreciate the two, uh, and I think in a way, when I play the organ, it enhances my 
sense of um, balance, timbre, mm -hmm. voicing, and counterpoint, and things like that. Yeah. Where the piano is, and I can take my brush and start to really create some you know, interesting colors. And it's also as an emotionally expressive instrument. It's the way I, I think. I think the piano is what the Chinese would call with the Chinese with the tabletop zither that they play. The uh, I forget the name for it, but um, I love the traditional Chinese Taoist type music that's written for the. Kuching, Kuchan, I forget mm -hmm. what it's called. Um, they referred to those in the past as uh, philosopher musicians. Mm -hmm. That playing the instrument actually was a part of expressing philosophy by recreating the experiences and sounds of nature yeah. through music. And I think of the piano, and when I'm at it, I'm more of a philosopher, pianist. But as an organist, Little, I'm not, but something closer to a theologian, pianist, as opposed to philosopher. Organ really has something about God implicitly in it, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So, I'm sorry, I got that's all right. That off that's all right. Bit. So, Balad, are you? Are you? So, if you're done, you know, I mean, if you have a, if you have a concerto of some sort, no orchestra, consider Balad. Are you drawn to any of this music? To Does play it? it? Uh, I would, I would love to play some of it. I played some of the nocturnes. I would love to try to learn, try to learn this piece. This would make it and, and the ballads too. Oh, the ballads. the ballads. I played some of those. No, 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 no. 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 nocturnes or what's barcarolles? Or orange barcarolles. Barcarolles, yeah. Oh, what's that thing? thing? This is a sonata for flute and piano, Opus Thirteen. I think this was originally a violin piece. It was say the mouth. I'm not sure if I played this with somebody. Paul Viardo. Oh. Yes, Paul Viardo. Viardo. Well, Pauline Viardo's husband. Yeah, possibly. Um, Foray at one time had fallen in love with their daughter, Marianne Bardo. And for reasons unexplained, uh, they were engaged, but she wound up breaking it off after a year. I played this. You have played yeah, it. it's been a long Is time. Is it violin piano? It originally was. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Originally for violin piano. Right. I did not play the flute, I played the violinist. Is it the same key? I think so, yeah. It's both okay. A major. All right. Yeah, this is the famous uh, Opus 13. I got a recording of this, and uh, I was weird. I went through a boring kind of period yeah. when I, just before I went to Madison, then while I was in Madison. Because I played the C minor piano quartet, mostly because of uh, Rubinstein's famous recording, and I love the piece. Uh, the whole thing I love. I love the the uh, rondo at the, the fourth movement, but um, da -di -da -da, um, di -da -da, ba -di -da -da. It's just this scale that pushes itself up through the octave, and this kind of uh, it's like a Greek chorus where there's uh, the primary statement and then the chorus reverberating or echoing what's being said. Um, I love Rubinstein's performance. I think it's with the Guarneri Quartet. Yeah. It, that's most of those later recordings that I did that. I played it in Palo Alto, California when I went to visit my aunties and there was some talented um, amateur musicians. There was, one was a judge. Another one was an uh, investor. Another guy had been an inventor, mm -hmm. sold some software kind of stuff to Apple or somebody and made a fortune. Mm -hmm. Very serious musicians. And then we read some music. I think there was, uh, we read for fun after the concert was over, uh, the Mendelssohn D minor trio. Oh! Harry pulled that. I said, let's do the trio. Can you play the trio? The middle's I said, give him a shot. But I did okay. Yeah. Ended up um, breaking some things in the piano. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so, Melbourne had, that was a nice instrument, actually, but yeah. it was a, what do you call it, a console? Yeah. A bright kind of piano, yeah. and it had plastic elbows, the things that connect the wire to the actual 
inside. It was plastic. Oh, where weird. nowadays they're kind of a strong rubber mm. kind of thing that holds them. And between uh, reading some Greek with them, I forget what that was. Greek violence or not? There are three of them. Yes. Um, and then the Mendelssohn. <laughs> yeah, the technician. <laughs> Had to come after that day. And uh, he eventually, he came twice because I broke it again. <laughs> oh, gosh. And then he just said, uh, why don't you just let me put in the newer version? Because they were plastic from the 50s. Ooh. So they got kind of a little dry. Yeah, out. yeah. And that's probably what they cracked so easily. But uh, they also had not experienced me yeah. up to that point. But she had new uh, modern rubberized ones put in. And she was, they were very sweet about it. It's just, our boy, he's so strong. He's a <laughs> strapping fellow, you know. And uh, they called me then, uh, I forget who it was, but yeah. one of their friends, a yeah. friend to me, is uh, Sir Mark the Piano Crusher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did a big program, actually. I remember. I don't remember everything, but the first half was solo. Yeah. I'm not sure what I started with, but I remember I played Masahonmas, Masahonmas, Japanese composer I met. Cross mode. It was really difficult. Modern piece. Cross mode from the 1970s. Wow. Very Japanese, very out there kind of composition. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, that first half I ended with Valley Doberman. Oh. That's how I kind of damaged the piano. Oh, well, that would <laughs> definitely do it. And then the second half, we did the G minor Mozart piano quartet and the C minor foray. Boy, you were doing some heavy lifting that day, huh? Yeah, but she was young. Yeah. Full of heaven, bigger. So. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Have we uh, used to, Not we have more day. time? Or? Um, well, part of it's me talking so much again. Well, do you want me I to could save these until next week. Okay. If you want to keep going with that. Let me keep going? What you got? Okay, well... Let's not right. go too low, because I've discovered when I edit these things, however long the recording is, yeah. I spend twice as much time editing it. Right. So okay. this last one was two and a half hours, it was like five and a half hours. All right, what time did you start? Do you remember? 2.30ish. 2.30ish? Okay. okay. A little bit after. All right. Well, I'll make this one quick then. All right. Okay. PSI okay. goes to the movie. Oh, and we can... Did you hear the music? Did I hear the music? Did you like it in the watch show? What show? Oh, yeah! Yeah, 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 yeah you did. You brought up your little PSA. Yeah, I saw it. It was on the phone. I was great. trying to look for a popcorn. Uh, uh, popcorn yeah, thing. Good. To use as well, but I didn't find it. It was very good. I mean, if you haven't seen it, check out it. Do, uh, 0018. Yes. It was okay. just released this week. So, the movie we are going to talk about today is Ken Russell's. Ooh, one of those <laughs> music lovers. Uh, well, who's another? <laughs> I don't know this. One. Okay, this movie is, is that uh, it's, the French lady. It's um. I don't know. Oh no, Glenda Jackson. Glenda Jackson. Yeah. Oh, this is Tchaikovsky. This is Tchaikovsky. Oh, now come on. Yes, Ken Russell, the music lovers. This is the so This Tchaikovsky. is supposed to be Tchaikovsky. That is supposed to be Tchaikovsky. And are they lovers? Well, they sort of are, but no. But you don't. You know the story, okay? Yeah. You know Tchaikovsky's life, right? Yeah, but do they present it realistically in the show? Um, as close as they can get it. Nineteen seventy. Okay, as close as they can get it. Nineteen seventy. Yeah. Well, I played the Jackson was a little. Yeah. No figure that kid. But uh, yeah, you'll you'll be. Dis there's quite a few surprises in here. I mean, I didn't know historical. I mean, this movie is supposed to be taken as any references as a sort of a reference as to what Tchaikovsky's life was like, or even the people in, within his circle were like. Well, he was lucky because this lady was a countess. Yeah. Right? Who? The woman. The woman? Was I don't know if she was a, I don't know if she was a countess. Isn't this the woman who made for him, right? She gave him money and stuff support. No, that was Madame Von Meck. Oh, this is not Von this Meck. Isn't that, this is not Von Meck. Oh. So who's this lady? Supposed I to don't be? know who this lady was, but um, it was a it was a marriage of, well, they got married because, well, you know, there was there was suspicion of his you know his preferences, and so they decided to hide that by getting married. In 
this movie. Who so, Richard Chamberlain plays? Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky. And luckily for us, uh, there's plenty of piano music in this movie. I mean, what do we really know about Tchaikovsky? I mean, what, do, what does one know about 19th century typical homosexual culture? Uh, it didn't, that probably depended also on what country and what culture you're yeah. in. Like, uh, I mean, also, especially the class. Yeah. If you were high class, you could probably get away with stuff more. Yeah. Then middle class. And then the low class sometimes were the uh, appetizers for the high class. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they preyed on them. But um, I don't know. I, I, I think about it. You know, Tchaikovsky, I've seen so many things written about him. I remember who was the Susan McClary. You know what I'm talking about? Susan McClary. No, Susan McClary was very famous back in the 70s, especially 80s anyway. Yeah. By then, later on, I was in, um, no. When I really got into knowing about Susan McClary's writing, she was uh, at, uh, I think she was in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and I was doing my doctorate mm -hmm. out in Boulder. Susan M. C. and little C, then like Scottish Mac, Clary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was uh, one of the early leaders of the feminist musicology movement. And seriously, I mean, they took on Tovey and various kind of people. Mm -hmm. You know, Tovey, I think it's Tovey, it's an English musicologist. I'm thinking it's Tovey. Daniel or David? Um, D uh, Daniel Tovey, isn't it? Um, He's one of them that, that, that explains that the reason that Tchaikovsky's music is weak and effeminate is because he relies so much on the fourth and uses four one cadences instead of five one cadences. And then he drew certain criticisms yeah. about Tchaikovsky that... Um, No, he wasn't in the same league as Beethoven, right? Or even frankly, Brahms. Right. Brahms and Tchaikovsky knew about each other. They weren't one of his favorite right. people, but I think they respected each other relatively, not just composers more or less. But um, Donald Tovey, Donald Tovey. I'm pretty sure it was Tovey who she really went after. That was like her dissertation that got her started, and became her first big book, and she was looking at what eventually be, it would be was arguing with these ideas which were established by a, patri a, a, a patriarchic uh, musicology field where they made these decisions. Because, you know, we have feminine cadences and masculine cadences. Masculine ah, is the 5-1. Yeah. And the, the feminine cadence is the 4 or the, you know. And well, there's a lot made of that. And then, you know, Beethoven is like the boy with this steel girder. Five and, uh, one, five one. Yeah. <laughs> a big bowling pair of sack, you know, bowling ball sack. And then Tchaikovsky was looked at especially as that kind of a, a different orientation composer, but then there were slights made about it because there were things that were probably known, things like that. But, you know, we've talked about this before. Yeah. British, uh, the British ruled the world, right? I mean, at some point, certainly during the whole Victorian area, you know, rule Britannia, Britain rules the waves. They were all, every, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Literally, they, they were all over the place. And then, you know, if I mentioned Oscar Wilde, who was in prison for a period of time, he was uh, too open at the time. And uh, even though he's from I don't know if he was from super high class, but he eventually migrated into that territory and he may have assumed that he was safe. Yeah. And also pushed the boundaries because he was uh, he was doing a lot of social commentary through his creative mm -hmm. work. And it was too much for him eventually and he got put away for a while. And it hurt him afterwards in certain ways, but I remember seeing some other things. You know that uh, that wonderful movie they made about the uh, Benedict Cumberbatch plays the role of the guy who created 
the ability to break the uh, Nazi code in England. Oh, I remember that. They movie. did that movie, the something yeah. machine, right? Yeah. But he created this machine, and he figured it out very interestingly so well that they knew what the Nazis were doing Every way, way earlier. I mean, like at least for two or three years. Yeah. They let it play out because they were afraid that if they started showing up every time when the Nazis were doing something, Nazis are smart boys, yeah. they figure out, damn it, they broke the code. They know how to read our code. Yeah. And instead, they necessarily, they played it like a chess game yeah. for at least the last two years of the war. The British intelligence especially played it out so that they allowed themselves to suffer and lose in certain yeah. places here and there. But we're playing a slow game to win the board, which of course they eventually did, but um, the fellow, the scientist, famously, to the, his, his female friend, yeah, he was special, yeah, you know, she knew. I don't know that people were as comfortable with it coming in the Victorian and Edwardian period, yeah, especially let's say middle class and even, I don't know what the lower yeah. class, it's hard to tell because you know, pirates and boys out at sea, so, yeah. but um. The upper class is a whole different panel. Yeah. But um, he, he, I forget what they call the thing, it's something, machine that broke the Nazi code. I'll look this terms up. But after it was all done, and actually they didn't make known, the British kept the fact that they had broken the code. The Nazis never knew, never knew that they did. Yeah, uh, and they apparently didn't make it public until the late sixties, more than twenty years after the war was over. Did they even come out and say what had really happened? And this is how it happened, yeah. because then all of a sudden there's this, the Iron Curtain and all this, and this Cold War started up, and they figured, well, we better keep our mouth shut. And we're not sure what to do. But the sad thing was the scientist guy. Who came up with the machine? Yeah. Basically, it's a computer. He created the first computer, yeah. big, huge thing, in a big building, and it was all based on mathematics and things that we worked it out. He was forced to get um, oh, cut off the balls. Yeah. I forget you from that. But neuter, neuter. Um, because they, they, some people at the time had found that when you did that, the guys that took their uh, prowess and their yeah. urgency away, and then they also connected that with some kind of animalistic aspect of yeah. homosexual sex. Yeah. This urgency to do it in the wrong way. Yeah. And uh, I don't think they, I'm not sure if they cut it, they didn't cut it. But they did medical, what do you call the procedure when they did that, like the castrati? When they cut off your testicles. I forget the I'm sorry, I forget the word, maybe better we don't say it all the time. Yeah. But um, he was medi oh, castrated. Castrato, castrated. castrated. Yeah. So he was medically castrated. Yeah. And he was also always very sensitive, very fussy guy, but in the war, they knew he was brilliant, they knew he was on the side, let him be himself. But after it was done, he had a bad end to his life. And part of it was this bullshit. Yeah. And then, um, it's a magnificent film. I love Benedict Cumberbatch. He does a tremendous role with that. Why are we talking? Oh, because of that. Can I show him the movie? Yeah, please. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I honestly don't know enough. About Tchaikovsky, I mean, I love a lot of his music and such. I know quite a bit of his music. Not real, I've never done a big study of his life. Yeah. So I don't really know what the stories are about how he lived and such. He wasn't married. Uh, was he? I don't I think, think so. Well, according to this, he, he was, was early on it for a period, but, the yeah, last for, but it was no, he, later period. I mean, when he was younger, yeah. I think he was. You know, traditionally in ancient Greece, back in the days of Pythagoras and stuff like that, yeah. it's very interesting that homosexuality was commonly practiced. Um, 
the stories you hear in the schools for the, for the men. Of course, those were the upper class boys and things. But what would usually happen in ancient Greece, Robert Graves writes about this, and I am, what's his name? I have some of their books uh, talk about the ancient Greeks, for example, Greek, Athenian culture. Necessarily, men would engage with women from their later teens until about 30, because they had to procreate. They needed to have children, hopefully sons. And then uh, certain of them, especially the ones who would start schools, that was a very common way in the upper class to educate these people. If you'd shown a real predilection and had a real mind for various subjects, mathematics and rhetoric and various things like that, you'd start a school. Well, in the practice was a lot of homosexual activity mm -hmm. through the teens and with the teachers and all that kind of stuff. It was not looked at in any kind of bad light, as is common in the mark time. Um, but there was that period of time when the women would be necessary to be mothers. But then also, once the guys kind of went off into their own kind of world, the women had their world, but they were also responsible for maintaining property and status of the family and the culture and stuff. You know, people, th there was no shame in the man being homosexual. This was just part of the culture, and people practiced that way. But uh, I, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Oscar Wilde is probably one of the most famous moments in that period of coming out of the 19th and early 20th century. So the um, Victorian into the Edwardian period. And then there's the Tsar Nicholas. The, the Victorian culture had a worldwide impact on human culture, in the West especially. Right. And I actually read things and made, figured some stuff out of myself that it was due to the extreme rigidness and, and suppressive uh, behaviors and um, rigid and, and censoring kind of behaviors about public, the way you conduct yourself in public. Yeah. This led to the kind of deep emotional repression that made it possible for Freud to discover a whole new field of science. Because what he was basically doing was digging up repressed emotions having to do with uh, subject matter that was you don't talk about. You know, um, homosexuality, mommy lust, and yeah. all these things which are now considered some, in some ways part of natural human behavior in a way that misunderstood it. And then perhaps in some cases mispracticed. But uh, my impression for what I've known about his personal life, because there was a Russian film I saw. Yeah. About him. You're going to talk yeah, about Yeah, it's called that? Tchaikovsky. Yeah? Yeah, I have it somewhere. You know? I got to dig it out though somewhere. It's, I, I, heard, I do, it do think he did have a wife, wasn't he? But did I she think, last the whole time? Or? No, she did. She wound up, uh, I believe she wound up. Committed, yeah. because um, I mean, she had this thing about being significant among artists. Oh, that's right. You know, you're right. And so it just she wound up having a bunch of these affairs. Profligate. That's right. Well, and part of it was because and she wound up because Peter wasn't. Uh, what did they give her enough, Peter? Yeah, enough of Peter. To the blazer. Yeah. But uh, Madame von Meck was older than him, too. Yeah, and, and Tchaikovsky was not the only uh, uh, musician that she supported. No. She also supported Debussy. I think I heard that, yeah. So, I mean, she I mean, she was very much into the arts. Very interesting so, person to study, probably. Yeah. But would you like to know the musicians, the roster in this sucker? Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. The music lovers, Ken Russell Film. Here is the roster. They brought in big guns here. London Symphony Orchestra plays the orchestra. Is the orchestra? Andre Previn is that. the conductor. director. Yes, the pianist Rafael Orozco. I know the name. Yeah. He's he's, he's in from a, Spain. He's in a com 
a mixed uh, LP collection of pianists. Yeah. Rafael Orozco, he is from Spain, born 1946, died in 1996. The guy was only 50 years old. He plays Tchaikovsky. He plays the Tchaikovsky and a bunch of solo pieces and everything, right. too. But he is the pianist chosen to do all the piano work on this. So. Anybody else was that? Uh, that was it. Yeah. I was just remembering, I don't think I finished when I was I got off my table to talk about Susan McClary. Uh huh. Um, we had to kind of look into this because, um, in the academic world, especially as far as musicology is concerned, feminist musicology was really beginning to assert itself mm -hmm. in a way challenging uh, preconceived or preordained uh, explanations even music, why music was, and then making the extrapolations, I mean, the patriarchy was responsible for that, about what music represented in terms of admirable human qualities or not admirable human qualities. And um, you might look her up because there's a lot of great early writing and then she was like kind of the mentor for a number yeah. of uh, ladies and I also believe more homosexually oriented men who may have been influenced by our work. Um, I think he's very open, and I, I don't feel bad about this, but I knew a guy, he's a Quaker, and he I don't know where he is now, but he's a musicologist at Madison. Really remarkable guy, wonderful fellow. We used to take the bus together. And he was a bit older than me, he was a young professor, and I was in my master's degree. It was probably 10 years difference or so, but he was quite a brilliant, I mean, really brilliant. He'd written some great works and stuff, and it, was along the same kinds of lines in terms of expanding considerations. Because, you know, the Groves Dictionary, I was just reading about this recently. Even 1980 versus their 2000 version. And what I have is the 1980 edition, which is pretty good. Yeah. Which is quite more progressive along the way than famously back in the 30s. There was one yeah. where List had like about this much of a... Yeah. <laughs> An article in it, yeah. you know, just a rock on of you, rock on of you, like a paragraph. Or I mean, two. just this British, <laughs> you know, yeah. dismissive attitudes. And now, I mean, this is a huge part of the 1981. Yeah. All the pages of it. He was a prolific composer. Oh, absolutely. With the yeah. serial numbers, they go up into the hundreds. Yeah. Way in the hundreds. Oh, way in the six hundreds at least, or seven hundreds. Yeah. Um, So. Uh, there's things about Tchaikovsky, uh, I just say, that are very Tchaikovsky. Yeah. Uh, what I think is different, what I really feel about him, I mean, well, of course, not a ton of stuff, and he is somebody that, to my mind, you write, oh, that's Tchaikovsky. Yeah. If you don't know the pieces, you can yeah. kind of figure it out, but he only wrote six symphonies, and there's a few other works in this three yeah. famous ballets. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. But the way things are right with the orchestra is um, strings versus the winds. It's like it's this counter kind of voicing going on. And he, they treat the winds a little bit more, in my mind, he does, a little bit more like winds in a concert band, you know, with the way they play together and with yeah. each other. Um, and it's not strictly that they're not mixed together. Of course they yeah. are. But then, of course, Rachmaninoff is very different. I mean, he's, oh, yeah. it's really thoroughly mixed and integrated kind of writing. But um, that, and then the business with um, the cadences, there is a preference for um, plagal cadences, mm -hmm. another word for the feminine, yeah. um, or subdominant teutonic cadences. Yeah. Or movements like that. Um, I was told it was the Amen Kings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the church. That's very interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Because the Russian Orthodox Church was hugely important to the people and nationalistic yeah. and played a huge role with the Tsar Nicholas family and everything. That's very interesting because there might be a connection like that with Tchaikovsky and Foray. Yeah. 
the influence of the church music on their own music. I never thought of that till just yeah. now, is what he said today. Um, uh, the concerto was just an extraordinary yeah. creation. I know you played some of your solo piano music. Uh, which was like Tchaikovsky? Seasons. Oh, yeah, I played some of it. I don't like it. You don't like it? Oh. Have you ever tried the romance in F minor? Yeah. No? I mean, in general, I, the one piece that I do like yeah. is None But the Lonely Heart. The song. Dee da da dee da 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 they did the movie called Not by the Lonely yeah, Heart. Heart. Exactly. Yeah. With Cary Grant. Yeah, yeah. One of his best dramatic roles. Okay. He plays kind of a grown up man out on the streets, kind of a tricky dicky kind of guy making yeah. money here on the side. Totally devoted to his mom who still lives in tenement housing and stuff. And uh, oh my god, it's, oh that's a weeper. Oh that's <laughs> because his mom finally dies and stuff. Oh my god. It's, it's an amazing role that Carrie Grant does. And the music is perfect for that. Again, there is something weird about not all of them. Because isn't the one of dum bum ba bum bum ba da Dina number six bum 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 ba the sixth Here's symphony the, is really quite interesting. Yeah. But then there's the fifth and that famous five four weird almost waltzy like Yeah, that's movement. a number six as well. Is the, but, a there's a, but there's a uh, an odd uh, yeah, it's in five Number four. Beats in the fifth symphony too, isn't there? Mm, the fifth symphony is in G major. It's um uh, da 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 da. Oh, it's an E minor. Sorry. Yeah. Da 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 da. da, da, da. But isn't there da, a dance? Then there's another one. No. With, da 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 di. Yes, da, that's the slow one. Yeah. What's after that? The scared song. Is this um, go in a an odd numbered? I'm pretty. It's like seven. Know, I'm pretty eight, sure measure or something. I'm it's not four sure, three. but I'm sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure because number six has five movements. It's not four. Yeah, it's five four. Right? Yeah. How's that movement? Do I know? can't. Da 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 da. da uh, stuff like that. It's it's mm -hmm. it's in five four. It's it's got a triplet in it somewhere in the theme. The main thing. That's. I think the, all you got to do really compare the two guys. Really see the difference in their musical language, their yeah. sense of ideas. One was, I, I like this idea that the right. uh, the Russian, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Orthodox Church? Yeah. Because their stuff is, there's no organ is, that I know of in traditional Russian music. It's all male, male choruses. Voices. Yeah. And those Russian singers, oh, 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 yeah. almost exactly. like Tibetan monks. Yeah. Um, and then the Catholic French church with a lot of organ in, again, male chorus. Yeah. Um, that might explain part of what Tchaikovsky had in his ear and in his cultural yeah. perspective. But I would just say um, get a nice collection. I like a lot of different. Uh, I'm actually thinking, you know, to recommend Abado's Four Brahms Symphonies, yeah. for example. There's other ones I like very much, wonderful performances, but it is. And then um, Previn was a great interpreter of Russian music. Oh, yeah. One of the absolutely. first two CDs I bought was the Second Symphony of Rock Monolith. Monolith, absolutely. With the uh, Symphony that's of a good Philharmonic. I'm not sure that is it. a good one. Oh, my God, that's amazing. And it's with the full score, it's the original yeah. stuff, not the chopped up stuff. Yeah, I used to have it on cassette tape, and then my tape player chewed up the. Damn he got it. Oh yeah, he did. The emotion and everything. It's it's a magnificent performance. I'd say if you can get some of the Tchaikovsky. And one, two, and three, let's say, are probably not as important as four, five, and six of Tchaikovsky, yeah. especially five and six. Um, but if you listen to the Tchaikovsky symphonies and listen to the Brahms symphonies, you will hear from the beginning, a very different orientation. I mean, it's not fair initially, because Brahms didn't write his first symphony until he was only 50 years old. Yeah. Tchaikovsky was working on it before that. So yeah. that's why one, two, and three are a little bit more classic -y, youthful works. Yeah. Uh, and then he begins to explore, you know, more truly romantic and fully realized and mature kind of understandings yeah. of how he uses the orchestra. 
uh, especially in five and six. Yeah. Um, Bernstein's good. Bernstein's good. Yeah. Good interpreter. Um, but then you'd really see, because we talked a little bit, you know, today then about Foray being part of the French school. And yeah. How that's so different from the German or the Russian school. Yeah. We were to compare, and Brahms and Tchaikovsky knew about each other. They were oh, yeah. Temporaries. And I think, did they meet one time or something? No, yeah. I don't believe they ever meet, but I, you sent me, you sent me a site, a link yeah. of uh, uh, composers uh, making insults to each other. Oh, yeah. And Brahms and Brahms and Tchaikovsky definitely did not like each other. No. I mean, there was definitely, I mean, more so, I think Tchaikovsky was a little more intense with how much he didn't like Brahms' yeah. music. One of them was a little bit more crass. Yeah. Yeah, or less prone to be public about yeah. their feelings. But, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, Tchaikovsky in and of himself, he was quite successful. He oh, yeah. came over to the United States and conducted with um, Hans von Bülow. Bülow. Yeah, Hans von Bülow yeah. played the Tchaikovsky Viva Monica Chero with the Boston City Art. Yeah. Stuff. The conductor was Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky. Yeah. They did that performance. Can you imagine that? From Bülow and Tchaikovsky yeah. doing the composer's Music. famous concerto over here in America. Yeah. Brahms never came to America. No. Brahms was a. Brahms is not a big traveler. I mean, once he made his way down from Hamburg to Vienna, I think the farthest he went was out into the countryside in Austria yeah. for summer breaks. You know. yeah. He seldom went anywhere. It is final five. Oh, well, we got a big one today. Then. Yeah, we did get a big oh, yeah. one. Hey, folks, if you really enjoyed our content today, and my, did we, did we do a lot of talking today? Uh, that's me. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Push, uh, punch that notification bell. So you don't miss a single episode. Um, I think I saw the numbers. Facebook, we've got 61 followers. Yeah. Wow. And YouTube, I thought it said 40, 47. Seven, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So forward. somebody's watching this stuff. Oh, yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> well, come back again, folks. I, I, I feel a big surprise coming in the next couple episodes. We're uh, going to do that. Uh, yes, we are. We are. The end of the month. End of the month. I okay. could, yeah. Actually, so, I would encourage people to maybe look into that. What, the book? Yeah, tell them about it. Okay. It's the basic the principles. Music, yeah, the basic principles of piano playing by piano. Joseph. Piano Le forte playing. Piano forte playing? Okay, piano yeah. forte playing by Joseph Levine. You can get a copy uh, from Dover. Dover still Station. publishes yeah. it for seven it's bucks. This But I mean, chances this are you could go on eBay and find a little old copy. Yeah, you could. It's very interesting, but we're going to study it ourselves. Yep. And then we're going to devote the uh, last Thursday of the month, the 30th, I yes. think, to trying to talk about, yeah. during that show, what he's saying in there. Yeah. It's going to be focused on that. Yeah. Hopefully we could go so if you want to study it beforehand and read it, The Basic Principles of Piano Forte Playing by Joseph Levine. L-H-E-V-I-N-N-E. -N -N -E. Yes. Forward by Rosina. Yeah, by his wife. wife. Yeah. Okay, folks. Have a good week. It was kind of fun. Kind yeah, of different. It was fun. I learned a lot. I did too. Well, this is Mark. I didn't know. I'm Mark. I'm Elmer. And this is PSI, PSI Piano Scene Investigations. investigations. Like Later. That? Oh, it was wonderful. Okay. Later, folks. See ya. Mm -hmm.